Now it's working. Okay. Welcome, welcome uh, everyone uh, to uh, to our conference today. Uh, it's a real pleasure for for us as FEBS, but also Fondation Jean Jaurès and Friedrich Herbert Stiftung, together with the SND Group here in the Parliament, to welcome you so uh, so many uh, in the Parliament. Uh, my name is Leticia Thyssen. I'm a policy advisor at FEBS, uh, and I'm here today with my colleague Amandine Clavouillon from Jean Jaurès. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Je suis ravie d'être présente parmi vous au nom de la Fondation Jean Jaurès que je représente, comme Laetitia l'a dit, pour la conférence qui nous réunit aujourd'hui, à la veille de la Journée internationale des droits de la femme, et pour cette conférence qui traitera donc de la régression des droits des femmes en Europe. Pour la Fondation Jean Jaurès, il était naturel d'être partenaire de cette conférence aux côtés de nos partenaires, la FEPS, la Fondation Frédéric Hébert et également le groupe socialiste et démocrate qui nous a apporté tout son soutien. La Fondation Jean Jaurès a toujours mis l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes au cœur de son action. Nous organisons chaque année des conférences publiques et des séminaires fermés en France en Europe et dans le monde, sur toutes les thématiques liées à l'égalité, sur toutes les thématiques liées à la défense des droits des femmes, que ce soit l'égalité professionnelle, la parité et la représentation des femmes en politique et au-delà, la lutte contre les violences sexuelles et sexistes, mais aussi la défense pour la santé et les droits sexuels et reproductifs. Tout ceci euh, s'accompagne de publications, d'analyses, de tribunes et euh, d'enquêtes. Là, vous pouvez voir euh, sur les écrans la dernière enquête que nous avons sortie avec, euh, avec la FEPS qui traite des, des femmes face aux violences sexuelles et au harcèlement dans la rue. Ces travaux ont pour objectif... Euh, Okay, but I'm sorry, but I will speak in French. So, so I'm a French organization, so I will speak in French. No, the, 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 in, the interpreters uh, are a bit late, so it's, it's only for now, but they should arrive uh, very soon. Um, donc, tout, tous les travaux uh, que nous menons ont pour objectif de contribuer uh, au débat public, où on soumet uh, des propositions et des recommandations avec le concours des institutions, mais bien sûr des universitaires, des responsables politiques et syndicaux, et bien entendu des associations féministes françaises et européennes et internationales. À la veille de la journée internationale des, des droits des femmes, faire l'état des lieux de, de, des avancées en matière des droits des femmes, mais surtout pointer du doigt les reculs en matière de droits des femmes en Europe apparaît fondamental. On le voit bien euh, au sein de l'Union européenne, l'indice euh, d'égalité euh, femmes-hommes montre, euh, montre combien les inégalités sont persistantes au sein des, des États membres dans le contexte des montées des populistes euh, et bien sûr de l'élection de gouvernements conservateurs où on le voit, les droits des femmes sont les premiers menacés et les premiers euh, touchés, en particulier en ce qui concerne les droits sexuels et reproductifs et la lutte contre les violences. En France, nous partageons euh, ces inquiétudes concernant les atteintes euh, qui y sont faites, notamment euh, pour la défense euh, des droits sexuels et reproductifs. Plusieurs exemples euh, en la matière, les propos euh, tenus par le président euh, du, du syndicat des, des gynécologues obstétriciens euh, de France, Bertrand de Rochambeau, qui euh, a invoqué euh, sa clause de conscience et qui affirme que euh, l'IVG est un homicide. En effet, la clause de conscience des médecins conduit à rendre difficile l'accès des femmes à l'avortement. Et on l'a vu lors, lors de, de différents articles dans la presse l'été dernier, où le cas de l'hôpital de Bayeul, qui est situé dans la Sarthe, ne pratique plus l'avortement, et donc conduit les femmes et les oblige à se rendre à plus de 60 km pour se rendre dans des centres hospitaliers à Angers et au Mans. 
Euh, autre point, on voit la multiplication des, des attaques euh, contre les moyens de, de, de contraception. Et enfin, euh, la structuration du mouvement euh, pro-life et leur stratégie de communication où on le voit, ils utilisent la figure, ils en viennent même à utiliser la figure de Simone Veil pour en détour, détourner les propos sur Internet. Donc face à cela, euh, les forces progressistes doivent impérativement se mobiliser, se coordonner pour déployer une stratégie de communication tout aussi efficace dans la société, sur les réseaux sociaux, pour ne pas laisser la place à des discours conservateurs qui, ne, en fait, ne plaident en rien pour l'émancipation des femmes. Et donc, à ce titre, et j'en terminerai là, la Fondation Jean Jaurès et la FEPS seront présentes lors de la 63e session de la Commission des droits de la femme à l'ONU, et donc, nous nous attacherons à défendre fermement les valeurs d'émancipation et d'égalité qui sont des valeurs auxquelles nous croyons profondément. Et donc, voilà, j'ai hâte d'entendre les différentes interventions. Et puis, je vais laisser la parole à ma collègue Laetitia pour, pour la suite. Merci. So, thank you. Thank you, Amandine. Uh, so, here we are today uh, as the representatives of our organizations, but also as young women who observe that suddenly women's rights that we thought could be taken for granted are suddenly under serious threat. Uh, we see the rise of authoritarian nationalism a bit everywhere in the world, but also in Europe. Uh, some of these countries are in recession, some of those are booming. Others are concerned with the fear of immigration, others not at all. But what they all share, besides uh, their hostility to liberal democracy, is the fact that they are trying to uh, subordinate women and that they do not, do not conceive gender equality as something beneficial to society. In order to understand this global Trumpism, we need to remember that, uh, that historically speaking, uh, people have been, have been uh, uh, in relationship Uh, that, have, that, that have been for, forged by a certain social contract, whereby some men are ruling others in return for these men to rule over women. This, no, this order has for, for a long time been considered as something natural, as natural as maybe some parents ruling over their children, because this is the, the structure that is reflected at home. Uh, and that is why women empowerment many times is seen as something disruptive of this order. Uh, historically speaking, this is nothing new. Uh, already many years ago, we have seen gender backlashes. Uh, revolutionaries or counter-revolutionaries have uh, used the specter of women power in order to delegitimize the, po the, 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 the regime uh, in place. And they, once, once, they came to, once they came to power, they, uh, they decreased women's rights in order to validate their own authority. Take the example of the French Revolution. Marie Antoinette uh, was portrayed as the symbol of the, of the, of the immorality of the Ancien Regime. So once in power, uh, the revolutionaries uh, in France have started uh, decreasing uh, women's rights, such as preventing them from access to a, to a, to a property of lands. Uh, they were, they were prevented, prevented from a senior teaching positions and so on. Uh, and we see similar pat patterns across history. Now, to, today, we have Trump, we have Orban, uh, law and justice in Poland, and so on. But all these aut autocratic leaders are nothing revolutionary. Uh, if we come back to present days, uh, examples are not lacking. We see, we see the case in Poland where the government has been raiding uh, the offices of uh, women's rights organizations in the context of the black protest. We have Romania where uh, a referendum has uh, taken place uh, concerning the, the, the ban of uh, same-sex marriage or Hungary where recently the, the gender studies faculty has been defended. However, looking only at Eastern Europe would not draw the full picture. Uh, we have Germany, for instance, where doctors uh, are are pursued because, because they, uh, they are informing people about abortion. We have the Manif Portus, which has been uh, very strong in France. In Italy, the government is currently supporting measures that would prevent women from, uh, from uh, accusing the husband of domestic violence if those ones are not convicted, and so on and so on. But I'm going to stop here. So we see, we see that what, this, what these uh, leaders are currently doing is that they put into question gender as a way to legitimize legitimize themselves. Uh, in those times, women's movements are experiencing a lot of trouble. 
uh, because, of course, in order to defeat those leaders, uh, we need to increase women's rights. But the more they do so, the more, uh, the, more uh, the gender backlash is becoming strong. Fortunately, social media, and the Me Too especially, has provided a useful means in order to overcome the traditional gatekeepers. Uh, however, in the long term, what is important to do is not only focus on women empowerment, but about the uh, focus on the normalization of this empowerment. Take the case of Nordic countries, for example. Their women, women leadership is something completely normal. Uh, if you look at the, at the parliaments in Iceland, for instance, you have 48% of women. In Finland and Sweden, they have 40, 44 and 42. Uh, it doesn't mean that, that a Nordic urban would be impossible, but what it means is that it's much harder for these parties to use gender as an excuse to delegitimize uh, the, their predecessors. Uh, that is why progressive forces really need to own the F word. And here, of course, I mean feminism. Um, they need to do so in the name, in the name of uh, freedom of choice, of equal opportunities. This definition is particularly powerful, uh, namely feminism is the radical notion that women are people because it stresses the humanity of women and that whenever our societies are oppressing women, they take away that humanity. Uh, and of course, democracy is not possible without feminism. Feminism is a, is a condition for democracy to take place. That is why we are all gathered today. We decided to, to, to organize this conference because we want to address these issues. We want to map and explore what is currently happening, which is going to be discussed in the first panel. And in the second time, we are going to analyze uh, the current trend whilst also providing progressive answers. Uh, but before, before the start of our panel, we are going to have an introductory speech uh, delivered by Agnès Hubert, uh, the president of Gender 5 Plus, but also FEP Scientific Council member, uh, along with Christian Vesker, representative of AGE, the European Institute for Gender Equality. Thank you, everyone. Well, on the program, but I mean, Christian is very sort of galant, but uh, on the program, you had Christian first and uh, me afterwards, but uh, I mean, I, I can start. Um, uh, I, I'll be happy to start so that I won't uh, repeat anything he says. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it's a great occasion, and I thank FEPS for organizing this, uh, this meeting on the, uh, the regression of, women, of women's rights, right? Um, and let's sort of try and, and think uh, in gender terms. I've always liked, I mean, uh, um, Leticia just mentioned the idea that uh, um, the gender or feminism was disruptive. Uh, I mean, it's a good way of, of putting it as well. Uh, I would say that thinking in gender terms is uh, usually to demystify uh, or to apply a critical view to uh, uh, what is deemed to be the common sense too often uh, and to show that the king is naked, right? I mean, it's the same way of sort of, I mean, same, a different way of saying the same thing. Uh, I will sort of uh, deal with, uh, concentrate on two issues. First of all, um, the demystify the, the backlash, right? Or I um, call it backlash, it can be called re regression. And in the second part, I will look at sort of some of the tools I can imagine for sort of progressive solutions to, uh, uh, to the current backlash. 
Uh, so the mystified backlash is what? It's going beyond the evidence and finding the, the roots of, the, uh, of that backlash. Uh, where does it come from? Um, I think it's beyond attacks on democracy, on Europe, and on women's rights, right? Uh, and beyond, it means that it comes from an excess of liberalism. Uh, remember that, uh, I mean, the, the, one of the first manifestations in Hungary that was sort of uh, uh, theoretically led by, by Orban was to talk about illiberal democracy. Why? Because there is so much uh, liberalism uh, which has affected people negatively in their daily lives uh, that uh, the, the question of illiberal democracy or contesting the rules of liberalism started to catch on people's ears and on their votes, basically. And this is the, the same issue which is going all over Europe with the rise of populist parties, uh, the Gilets Jaunes in France in many ways, etc. Uh, it takes a lot of different expressions, but it is uh, the same. Um, the, um, then, um, I think thinking in terms of, of um, I mean, in uh, uh, demystifying the backlash uh, goes as well beyond the, some of the shocking attacks um, the, uh, the, of Vox, for instance, refusing uh, the, uh, uh, the budget for, for uh, the violence against women, uh, all the attacks against uh, uh, Soros, or the uh, CEU in Hungary, etc. Um, they all express a, a very strong rejection of women's rights. Uh, it is true. But beyond that, it's really cultural liberalism in general, which is at stake. So let's make sure that women's rights are respected, but make sure as well that it is part of a larger sort of concept. Um, the third thing on um, demystify the backlash um, is, um, I mean, going beyond the sort of uh, simple or what I would call perverse correlations, right? Uh, the correlations that are made between uh, the Me Too movement that would be against men. What are we talking about? Are we talking about the, the real victims or are we making men victims? So um, the other thing is the... Uh, um, as was mentioned by Leticia as well, the, the Trump voters, I mean, women would be accused uh, to, uh, to sort of uh, have too much emancipation and creating the Trump voters uh, because the Trump voters would have been first and foremost uh, anti-Hillary voters. I mean, no, let's sort of again, sort of look at the reality. The reality is really a sort of a, a backlash on women's rights, and men are not the victims. B, they, I mean, they are the victims of the liberal system just as much uh, as, uh, as women, and sometimes women are more. Okay, now sort of talking about uh, tools for progressive answers. Uh, progressive answers. Um, I lack the, uh, the uh, categorization of the, the three I's, which means uh, look at ideas, uh, interest, and institutions. If we look at ideas, I think there is a great need to demystify austerity policies in Europe. Um, we need to invest, and that's, that goes through uh, through all the sort of, um, I mean, the uh, uh, European uh, uh, recent policies. Um, it means uh, we need to invest in the future. We've uh, argued for austerity policies, sort of saying that uh, we could not leave a debt to our children. But, I mean, our children are getting disinvested in because education systems are disinvested in, health systems are disinvested in, uh, etc. And, uh, and we are sort of uh, uh, selling our assets to um, other powers like uh, the uh, Piraeus uh, Harbor to the Chinese or, or airports, or etc. So we've got assets that we must leave to our children, uh, plus we must really 
turn the European policies to invest much more in the future, which means very much in the social education health policies. Um, we must as well demystify uh, deregulation, which contrary to what a lot of economists have told us, deregulation was going to sort of save the crisis of, of unemployment, right? Deregulation has not created employment, I'm sorry. Uh, and no economist is coming up sort of with other solutions. But deregulation is not. I mean, regulation is very often a guarantee for those who are the most sort of in the most difficult positions on the labor market. Um, the third uh, idea in f fields of idea is um, parity democracy. Um, the sharing of power and resources between women and men is not a consequence of democracy, it's a condition of democracy. If there is a revision of the EU treaties, uh, we should again uh, sort of try and, and uh, uh, activate the question of party democracy, because this is what a sort of healthy democracy is based on, right? Um, then in terms of interest, um, the, um, the stakeholders, I mean, we've got to reaffirm, it is true, as I was saying right at the beginning, the links between democracy, women's rights, and the European Union. Uh, there are allied sort of fights and struggles, uh, and the number of stakeholders for defending women's rights, human rights, uh, should be as large as possible. But in the interest, we've got to make sure that we sort of create more women agencies as well. We finance women's associations, uh, and we make sure that the uh, the um, uh, the politi I mean politics, uh, women in politics is not enough. But that we need women who actually defend the interest of women. I don't know if you remember the the um, um, I mean the sentence of um, uh, Madeleine Albright. Uh, was, be, which has been used by Donald Tusk recently again in another context. But um, there is a place in hell for women who do not defend the interests of women or defend other women. And uh, I must say that uh, there is still a lot of women who do not see, probably because they don't want to sort of disrupt the common sense, but they, who do not see the point of sort of... Uh, affirming the rights because they feel it's a war against men. When it's not a, a war against men, it's really a war for women and men. Uh, my third point is institutions. Um, and there we need more women in decision making everywhere. Particularly, I mean, we are in, in the European Union, in European institutions, but as well in governments, parliaments, uh, at national level. Um, and the question of uh, having more women in European institutions is particularly relevant now as we're going to app appoint uh, all the, uh, the, the um, uh, sort of presidents of, uh, uh, and the sort of the highest level um, politi politicians in the European Union. Um, we've got as well to, strength to strengthen the institutions that deal with gender equality. Uh, not only have specific services in many places that deal with gender equality, but as well promote the idea of gender mainstreaming and particularly uh, in, uh, integrate the question of gender budgeting or gender sensitive uh, budgets. Um, for, because if we want to sort of go further, we must make sure that uh, resources are shared equally. So facing the backlash, uh, should give uh, more energy rather than sort of discourage people to fight. And the very first step uh, is to vote on the 26th of March and to vote for Democrats, preferably for women, but for people who are ready, men and women, to defend women's rights. And I'm really happy to see so many people, so many young people in, the, uh, in, the, in this room. Uh, remember that uh, it seems that if young people had been voting uh, at the uh, referendum in the UK when 
Brexit uh, was decided, uh, we would not be in the mess that we are in at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Agnes, and uh, I'm sorry for the confusion <laughs> at the beginning uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with the timings. Um, sometimes, is the microphone working, yeah? Sometimes, it, for me, it feels like, um, like the, as if the world is a, is a giant disorienting whirlwind, and things that uh, in the political realities we thought that were unimaginable only five years ago are now uh, a reality. There is probably no need for me to give any examples here because you already heard some of them uh, before, and I'm sure every one of you has a set of, um, of their own. Amidst all of these changes, where we hear some politicians and some political leaders who are supposed to bring people together, who are supposed to have the message of unity, they are being openly misogynist, homophobic, or racist. And we may find ourselves asking, how did we sleepwalk into all of this? Why did nobody say or do anything about it? So last night, when I was reflecting some of those profound political regressions that have shaken and, and are still shaking Europe and the greater global community, I remembered when years ago, I read the articles published in collection Gender as Symbolic Glue, which uh, many of you, I believe, uh, are familiar with. Um, in the chilling epilogue, Andrea Peto warns us by saying, I hope it's clear that no more time should be wasted in thinking of alternatives by progressive forces. This was published in 2015. Four years later, we find ourselves in seemingly everlasting, ever faster currents, knowing that some of those uh, achievements in gender equality are still being eroded at alarmingly faster speed. I want to be uh, very clear from the beginning that despite the regression and or stagnation in, in many areas, we also see progress here in, in Europe and beyond. We see uh, also hope, and I think this is really important for uh, us to have this feeling that there is uh, sort of hope that we don't get lost into, into feeling of uh, that everything is going wrong way. Uh, we see hope, for example, also in, in the United States, when, when they are reading for the new presidential elections, we see a surge from the progressive left whose main message of unity should also resonate across political spectrum in, in Europe. Uh, today here, I will merely scratch the surface uh, on this extensive topic by providing some of the examples of progress, stagnation and backlash, which I hope that uh, will contribute to the discussions that, that will take afterwards. Um, and again, another sort of positive story that I would like to start with from my own home country, Estonia. Uh, where despite the raise in the anti-equality sentiment, we also have a strong and pro-equality president, uh, Kersti Kaljulaid, and we just elected uh, our um, uh, parliament, Riigi Kogu, where previous, uh, or the MEP from the European Parliament uh, member, Kaja Kallas, got the most votes um, uh, in, in Estonia. So never before, uh, Kersti Kaljulaid, we have had uh, um, a woman president and let alone a uh, prime minister. Uh, when we talk about the um, uh, situation of women and men in the European Union, one of the tools that uh, EGE, where I work, uh, has developed and that help us uh, to monitor the progress is the Gender Equality Index. Uh, it is uh, very easy to understand for those who uh, don't know. So basically we have the scale from 1 to 100 where 1 is complete gender inequality and 100 is uh, full gender equality. And uh, um, <clears throat> what we see is that over the decade between 2005 and 2015, there was a marginal progress. So um, we can say st stagnation. Uh, it wasn't moving really forward in the EU. And the U union itself remains only half or, halfway towards gender equality. But having said that, um, I think it's important that um, here we talk about measurable outcomes. The other, yet the linked story, is the story of regression 
of women's uh, rights and in public discourse that uh, uh, you were speaking very much uh, about it as well previously. Um, over the years, uh, we have also seen processes uh, that hold the progress back and in many times contribute to the regression. We see that there is less political commitment to gender equality and many of the important gender equality um, uh, documents may have been or, or are not there anymore. Uh, we see also that uh, there has been a merger of gender equality bodies with uh, human rights bodies in the uh, national context, but yet these uh, bodies don't, haven't gotten more resources to deal with uh, all of the uh, discrimination grounds. And I'm happy to say also that uh, EGE will release uh, a publication later on this year that uh, is monitoring now the pro uh, process uh, of those, um, those bodies um, in the member states. So you can expect that uh, uh, sometime in, in autumn, so institutional mechanisms on, on gender equality. Um, strong civil society organizations, uh, of course, are an important indicator to uh, overall health of democracy. Consulting with women's rights and gender equality organizations is one of the prerequisites as also seen in the uh, Beijing Platform for Action. Um, we, with the Institute, we co cooperate strongly with the um, civil society organizations, European Women's Lobby and Social Platform, and, uh, and some other networks, and uh, it's something that we hear very often, that the space for the civil society organizations has shrunk and is shrinking, mm -hmm. and, um, and they feel that uh, at the national levels uh, there is less and less of these consultations taking place. If I can have the next... So what does it uh, all mean? It means that there is overall decrease in funding for gender equality and um, the, its difficulties to track the funds that go for, the, uh, for gender equality. Another report that will be coming up out very, very shortly is uh, the one on gender budgeting, where we have looked at uh, the EU funds um, uh, and their expenditure on gender equality. So there will be some of very interesting results where we can see how much of those, uh, the, this funding has been um, contributing to gender equality goals. But what we can see also that there is uh, a large part of it is gender blind funding and, uh, and there have, haven't been sufficient targets uh, for, for gender equality. And also that the dual approach to gender equality and gender mainstreaming is, um, is disappearing. Uh, but how did we get into that situation? Like uh, uh, it was said before already, uh, there is a, 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 a big imbalance when it comes to power. So one of the things in our index, what we looked at was the uh, power domain. And, uh, and what we can see is that uh, it's, uh, it's huge, huge differences across Europe. Uh, again, moving towards uh, 100 is moving towards more balance and, uh, and, uh, and towards number one is less, uh, less balance. So it's uh, only really halfway. Can we say that this is the situation where we need to be or where we want to be? Um, I also believe that while having numerical gender bal balance in power is not a mag magic wand, it still contributes to better decisions. And uh, we need to have not just num numerical gender balance, but also substantive gender balance. Uh, again, the um, information how um, how the um, uh, decisions are making in the making in the um, in the national uh, context, we see uh, the the huge imbalances there. And I would like to conclude. Uh, by remembering the words of uh, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau when in 2015, the same year where this uh, collection of articles that I referred to earlier came out, uh, he nominated his cabinet, where, where, which was 50-50. Uh, and when he was asked, uh, how come you have 50-50 uh, uh, cabinet, meaning 50% women, 50% uh, men, his reply was really quick, because it's 2015. Now in Europe we are in 2019. Four years have passed uh, since then, and, and I believe really that we can't 
really wait any longer and, and these elections provide us, all of us, uh, this opportunity to, uh, to vote with this conscience. Thank you. So just a very quick technical note, uh, thanks to the flexibility of the English uh, interpreters, we now have also English uh, interpretation because there will be some uh, speakers also speaking their native language. Is it working? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, so I, I would kindly ask you to take your seats slowly. We would start the panel, or if you take a coffee, then do it uh, in a silence. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, it's an honor for me uh, also to be here. I am Esther Kovács from the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung Budapest, and I have the honor uh, to chair this panel. Uh, so let me uh, welcome you also on behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Um, and uh, on behalf of my colleagues, uh, as I heard, it is taking place in the framework of a youth forum on gender equality. So there are plenty of young people brought uh, here by the Social Democrats to the European Parliament. And we are organizing this event in a big cooperation of Jean Jaurès Foundation, FEPS, and uh, FES, and so everybody. Uh, uh, so we are now approximately, we have 65 minutes approximately left. Uh, so we would like to use that time uh, very well. Um, what, it, what this panel is about is rather about mapping. So what is happening in the uh, uh, different countries presented here? We have the ambition that or we, have, we think that if we get to know a bit better what is happening in these four countries, it will give us an idea uh, what we are talking about uh, up after these uh, general remarks we heard in the introductions. Um, so what are, um, we are going to discuss these uh, 
challenges uh, already presented uh, uh, to us and we can disentangle what are the similarities and uh, what can be generalized from all these uh, uh, country case studies or what, what are only context specific things and what is something, what is new, what is global about it. So it's very difficult, also interesting to see what is old, what is new. Are these movements and campaigns anti-feminist, anti-woman, homophobic? Or are we maybe just not very careful about the overuse of these uh, words? Uh, or how, how do we uh, uh, try to um, uh, understand these? And of course, looking at the same time that um, it is a power struggle, it is a political strategy, but also not to maybe skip the chance or miss the chance to look into ourselves on the progressive size, uh, uh, side. How, uh, how did we contribute to this, or uh, um, what is our share of responsibility, and what can we do better or uh, differently? So um, I'm very much looking forward to this panel. We will, uh, I will just briefly introduce our uh, panelists like in one sentence. <laughs> then uh, I will ask them to have their own uh, uh, speeches, seven minutes each to mapping the situation in their countries, then I will present them a little bit longer. Um, and then we will, either I will ask one or two more questions, or if I see that the audience is very eager to ask, then I will immediately open the floor, and I hope uh, we will have a very exciting discussion before we go to the second panel. So, yes. Um, um, so we have four guests uh, here on the panel now. First one is Lia Migale to my right, uh, to the left to yours. She's an economist and writer from Italy. She's a member of the board of the International Women House since 2013. Uh, she was an uh, associate professor of business economics at La Sapienza University in Rome. Um, and during her professional and research career, she was entrusted with several institutional assignments, mainly in companies, in cultural field, and women concerns on a national and international scale. Uh, she's also author of several essays on feminist subjects and fiction. Her most recent novel is Incontri all'angolo di un mattino, Meetings at the Morning Corner, uh, published last year. Uh, so she will be the first to speak on the Italian case. But just before she starts, I will say just one word, one, in one sentence who is uh, with me. Um, Maria Skrabalo, she's here from uh, Croatia, for, uh, director of uh, Solidarna, the private foundation for human rights and solidarity in Croatia. Uh, Susanna Magyarova, who is a, a researcher uh, uh, from Bratislava. And Elena Zaharenko, who is uh, from Poland and a political scientist, policy expert in Brussels. So uh, first I ask uh, Lia Migala to uh, speak in Italian. Now we have uh, the translation settled. Um, seven minutes to tell us about your, the situation in Italy. Uh, in very, very briefly. <laughs> Thank you. Grazie per l'invito. Eh, noi come Casa Internazionale delle Donne che ha sede a Roma siamo qui per testimoniare quanta regressione sia passata in tempi brevissimi nel nostro Paese e come l'attacco alle donne eh, si eh, manifesti, si, sia alla base di un processo di, eh, come dice Wendy Brown, di de-democratizzazione ma anche quanto il movimento delle donne stia lottando su molti, su molti fronti aperti. La particolarità della situazione italiana è data da, una, ehm, da due elementi. Da un lato abbiamo di recente ormai eh, un governo ehm, populista e sovranista formato da due far, forze completamente diverse tra di loro ma che hanno questa ideologia populista e sovranista insieme e dall'altra un movimento femminista abbastanza forte e soprattutto molto diffuso sul territorio nazionale. E in questo senso c'è una particolarità tutta italiana, che è quella che, ha, che ci ha colpito direttamente quando il Comune di Roma ha cercato di chiudere questa Casa delle Donne, di chiudere questa esperienza. Vi premetto che in Italia le prime case delle donne nascono negli anni 70 con la nascita del movimento femminista e la Casa Internazionale delle Donne è un'espressione di tutto ciò. 
è un'espressione talmente importante che eh, perché ci chiamano ormai da, eh, sia da, tutti, da molte città d'Italia per replicare delle formule, ma addirittura oggi una mia collega del board della casa si trova in Norvegia a spiegare eh, che cos'è la Casa Internazionale delle Donne, proprio perché... Ehm, L'attacco che subiscono queste, do, queste case è un attacco politico, eh, anche se mascherato da aspetti legalitari. È un attacco all'autonomia e alla cultura delle donne e non semplicemente alla parità tra uomini e donne. Ehm, e, ehm, a Roma la revoca della Convenzione della Casa Internazionale delle Donne col Comune è stata seguita anche da altre eh, eh, decisioni come quella di colpire Luce e Siesta che è anche un centro antiviolenza e Donna Lisa anch'esso un centro antiviolenza. Ehm, tutto ciò però ha provocato immediatamente, questo è il contrasto, una reazione forte da parte delle donne, da parte di tutta la città, di tutto il paese. Eh, c'è stata una petizione con 100.000 firme, c'è stato... Uh, uh, assemblee cittadine e la prima grande manifestazione contro il governo di questo Movimento 5 Stelle a Roma um, tra l'altro uh, noi abbiamo cercato anche l'appoggio la, e la collaborazione delle grandi istituzioni nazionali e internazionali e eh, la commissione FEM di questo Parlamento uh, ci ha ospitate e poi in una delegazione della commissione è venuta a Roma e a Napoli proprio per considerare questo, questo attacco specifico, ma anche per l'attacco che invece viviamo di più generalmente in Europa sull'aborto. Ehm, devo dire che questi attacchi in Italia sono, ci sono da un po' da sempre, però è vero che c'è un crescendo rossiniano da quando la Lega e il Movimento 5 Stelle sono al governo. Uh, ovviamente il principale attacco all'autonomia delle donne avviene, come in tutta Europa, sulla legge che regola l'interruzione di gravidanza. Una legge che, bene ricordarlo, in Italia è stata sotto taglia paese dove la Chiesa Cattolica ha una sua forza specifica. Um, è stata sottoposta a ben due referendum che sono stati tutte e due volte vinti con la partecipazione massiccia delle donne. Oggi eh, questo attacco prende un'altra forma, e cioè il movimento pro vita, che, eh, tutti i movimenti pro life che sono in tutta Europa, con anche con altre sigle, ehm, attacca i movimenti delle donne, il movimento LGBT, ehm, ha trovato una sua specifica modalità nella richiesta che fanno di far passare nei consigli comunali eh, e, o regionali delle mozioni che identifichino quel comune o quella regione per la vita. A parte l'assurdo di pensare che possa esistere un comune o una regione contro la vita, è chiaro che questo è un attacco specifico alle donne perché si cerca di farle passare come delle assassine. Potenziale. Il nostro ministro della famiglia eh, Fontana non si è vergognato di dire che l'aborto è la prima causa di femminicidio eh, nel mondo, in Italia in particolar modo, benché eh, dimenticandosi che ogni due giorni e mezzo viene uccisa una donna per femminicidio. Devo dire che questo assurdo, comunque, è una mozione che a Verona ha avuto, è stata approvata, a Roma per fortuna siamo riusciti a... Minute. Bene, ehm, la terza, un altro fronte di attacco sulla quale adesso ci stiamo molto eh, battendo è quello eh, lanciato da un altro ministro del governo che ha presentato un progetto di, di riforma di, sulle separazioni che prevede mh, tali e tali meccanismi per cui alla fine impossib sarà impossibile per le donne chiedere la separazione. Questo vuol dire che si vuole ritornare a un rapporto di subordinazione delle donne e soprattutto nega che ci sia violenza nelle famiglie e pretende che eh, la, 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 mh, sia condiviso l'affido tra, tra padri e madri anche qualora la separazione è motivata da violenza. Inoltre il Governo ha lanciato un attacco sulla migra sui migranti, quindi le, sono colpite moltissimo le donne, eh, quelle soprattutto soggette alla tratta, perché è stato tolto la, eh, il permesso di, ehm, eh, di soggiorno per motivi umanitari e quindi le stanno ricacciando nella, eh, tra le reti criminali. 
In pochi, fra pochi giorni, del 29 al 31 marzo, proprio in Italia si, ehm, ci sarà a Verona eh, il famosissimo e famigerato eh, tredicesimo World Congress of Families che riunisce il movimento globale pro-life. Le donne, anche in questo caso, si sono mobilitate, il movimento non una di meno, sta organizzando negli stessi giorni una gran, gran, tanti eventi al centro del quale ci sarà per l'appunto la, um, uh, un confronto tra i movimenti femministi internazionali. Um, quindi, in conclusione, le donne italiane sono in mobilitazione permanente, ma quello che si deve veramente capire è che la nostra è una lotta per la democrazia, per la limitazione dell'ingerenza della legge e della burocratizzazione dei legami personali e anche, direi, per la crescita di una nuova classe politica in questa nostra Europa che ne ha molto bisogno. Vi dirò poi che, eh, io tro se, se ci sono domande, sarò molto lieta di parlare anche di che cosa penso che stia succedendo, cosa c'è dietro tutto questo e che eh, in realtà le donne devono rimanere assolutamente in per mobilitazione permanente perché ne hanno le forze e le capacità e dall'altra però devono anche eh, cercare sempre alleanze. Oh, sono stata nei sette minuti. Thank you very much. It was exactly seven minutes, so uh, uh, thank you. And I am sorry for, I, that I have to be so strict on the time, but uh, we want to have explored the most of it. Sorry. No, but you, yeah, you should switch it off. Yeah, okay. Now we are fine. Okay. Um, so my, uh, 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 thank you very much for uh, your um, uh, contribution, and we will definitely come back to understand and ask uh, what is behind all this. So, uh, uh, but um, now we turn to Marina Skrabalo uh, from Croatia, uh, who is the, the director of Solidarna Foundation for Human Rights and Solidarity, uh, founded in uh, 2015 as a strategic endeavor of the Croatian human rights community to enhance autonomy and sustainability of human rights activism in light of rising anti-liberal tendencies with special focus on women's human rights and resilience building. Marina also represents Croatian human rights organizations at the European Economic and Social Committee. Uh, she has published on issues related to reproductive rights policy, community mobilization and peace building, EU accession process and its impact on transparency of governance and the role of national parliaments and good governance in the non-profit and public sector. Um, so a very uh, wide range. Uh, again, you will have a seven minutes to talk about who are the actors and against what concept of gender equality are they mobilizing. Okay, thank you. So, first of all, thank you very much for uh, creating and organizing this event. Thank you all for your attention and interest in how we can all bring our energy and uh, ideals together and uh, resist and uh, take the whole of Europe back on track when it comes to European values, democracy and uh, respect for every woman, for her dignity and for her autonomy. Uh, I will ask uh, our friends uh, if they can project But I will be not, so this is just like a backdrop with more information, but you can listen to me. <laughs> okay. So, um, I, the Croatian situation in practice is very similar to the Italian situation. We are also neighbor, uh, neighbors, just like the situation in Hungary and in other countries uh, in Central and Eastern Europe and in the South of Europe, re they resemble each other. What is, how to say, becoming a big issue in Croatia and why is Croatia at present one of the strongholds of Catholic fundamentalist attacks on women's human rights because Croatia became is the last member state as you know we joined the EU in 2013 and uh, looking at on the slide too 
If we look at uh, what we know from research and a lot of in investigative journalist work and monitoring work, especially by Elena, who is one of the leading researchers in this respect in Europe, we know that the networks that the fundamentalists, I call them on purpose, not ultra-conservatives, but we call them religious fundamentalists because they are trying to impose uh, religious doctrines as uh, public order. And they think, and they claim that it is isn't enough to state that something is God-given and that societies should accept it. So they are going directly against the whole of the French Revolution legacy and the whole idea of a society deciding upon in a consensual manner which values we are all going to uh, stand behind and how to create space where we can agree which is inclusive and not exclusive. So religious fundamentalists, uh, Christian fundamentalists, are extremely well networked. They're very strategic. And Croatia has been targeted because it is very clear that they have upscaled all of their activities since Croatia's entry to the EU. Which, which is next slide, thank you, which was seen, which was very evidenced by the fact that only uh, less than six months after Croatia joined the EU, there was a, a homophobic referendum on heteronormative definition of marriage organized and our constitution was changed. Since then, we have been under, con cons the whole society has been really, I have to say, uh, bombarded by simultaneous campaigns, uh, you can go on and so on, against uh, education reform, against women's right to choice, against uh, the family law and any kind of liberalization of family relations, against Istanbul Convention ratification, against medically assisted uh, insemination, against uh, sexual and health education, against gay rights, against, uh, uh, against uh, journalists. So uh, just like human rights defenders, you just name it. There are constant campaigns going on. There is vertical and horizontal infiltration happening, horizontal through professional associations, just like in Italy, the apparel, doctors' associations, Catholic uh, physicians, Catholic educators. Uh, the school boards have been infiltrated by parents who are activists of uh, Catholic fundamentalist organizations. They claim to be protecting families, but through this protection they are excluding most of people, living people, in the name of idealized traditionalist concept of family, which is, of course, 100% patriarchal. So, uh, so what, uh, uh, we have all these ugly campaigns, which are, of course, uh, manipulating with facts and so on. Uh, and what has been happening, you can go on, it's okay. Uh, so what was the big deal last year? Last year, the, the, there was a huge mobilization against ratification of Istanbul uh, Convention. Uh, which the government did manage to pass. But the reality today is that, and that was very much held by international uh, para-legal uh, policy lobbying organized by ADF International with a lot of fake news, uh, also attacking trans rights. This is how they were presenting uh, the dangers, uh, you know, this, these are, this is their production. So uh, there was also battle for. There is a lot of organizing. We have a national platform for reproductive rights, which is bringing together different generations of activists uh, and experts. Uh, at the same time, there has been a big attack on access to abortion, which is in practice extremely limited due to under-regulated uh, conscientious objection, which is highly tolerated by the system, and hospitals that don't provide the service are not punished. So in the end, what we can uh, conclude is that, um, that what is happening is when you have uh, poor public management, when you have very low social investment in uh, education, health and um, education, health and social protection services, even when you, and when you have infiltration of ultra conservatives into mainstream political parties, you then have governments that are not capable or not willing to protect 
their own citizens, primarily women and children, against these attacks that are actually taking toll of lives. Because at the moment, because of lack of government action, we have had a series of most brutal uh, violent incidents against women, and it's very obvious that Croatia was, our Prime Minister was praised because he managed to ratify, but now there is no implementation. So the big message is we need to connect, we need to monitor what's happening transnationally. We are very enthusiastic about joining forces and coming in solidarity in Verona, and we need to present this attack against women's rights and uh, gender minorities, as I completely agree, as attack against democracy, attack, attack against our values, and it is attack on human security, on our safety, because this is really killing women who are not getting support that they need. Thank you very much for this enthusiastic and gloomy picture at the same time uh, <laughs> about uh, Croatia. And our next speaker is Susana Magyarova, who is a researcher at the Faculty of Social and Economic Sciences at the Comenius University in Bratislava, and at the same time, activist working for the first feminist organization in Slovakia called ASPECT. Her fo work focuses mostly on historical and current political subjectivities of women and gender aspects of political communication. She has been mapping the ev emergence and development of the gender ideology discourse in Slovakia and its reinforcement with other discourses such as conspiracy, nationalist, and anti-EU and anti-system discourse. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's really an honor to, to, to be here and thank you so much for an invitation and for organizing uh, this very important uh, event. Well, um, if we talk about Slovakia, we can see that the issues, uh, as it was already said, um, are very similar to other countries, and we don't have uh, that much time, so I would like to focus on one very specific thing, and that is uh, what does the success of uh, the discourse attacking uh, women's rights, uh, something that I call the anti-gender ideology discourse, uh, tell us about the state of the civil society uh, in Slovakia, but I assume other countries as well. Um, what we see based on the, the media presentation and uh, uh, different materials as well as uh, TV discussions uh, of, uh, of the actors of the, this anti-gender ideology discourse is uh, actually that uh, they are very often positioned uh, themselves as uh, victims of a uh, liberal regime. As, uh, as the victims of uh, witch hunt and uh, as, the, as being at the risk of uh, being cut off uh, financial resources and, and different resources. So we can see, and uh, now I'm uh, specifically talking because we know that uh, there are different actors. It's not a monolithic um, movement. We are talking really about uh, different organizations, political parties, the church, many individuals coming from very different backgrounds. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to talk about mostly uh, are the organizations that uh, are part of the civil society, um, non-governmental actors. Um, so this discourse of victimhood is something that is uh, very strong, uh, very present, uh, very often. And uh, what I want to say is that it's actually building on uh, this course and the critique uh, of the feminist and human rights organizations, something that has been articulated for years, uh, because it is part of the critique of the way how uh, non-governmental organizations are financed, how the priorities actually uh, are being set, and, uh, and by whom, and the critique that has been uh, going on by uh, feminist and human rights organizations for uh, decades, um, actually, about uh, the fact that uh, project-led financing is not enough because it's uh, jeopardizing the situation of, um, of the civil society, of the NGOs. So um, it's been going on for so, such a long time that uh, actually for, for the states and uh, very often also for the EU institutions, um, experts coming from uh, non-governmental organizations uh, have become a group of people always complaining uh, about something. And uh, I myself um, was few times a victim of uh, different events when uh, people talked about 
um, or organizers talked about uh, the event themselves, the, itself, and uh, the people presenting there. That you know, like, if in the panel there are um, people coming from NGOs, you need to be very careful how you are going to moderate the event because then they are going to complain all the time, over and over again, and we don't get uh, any relevant information. So if this is not the uh, very case of, uh, or, or if it is not um, a picture, how we actually exploit the, the knowledge coming from the NGOs, um, then I'm not really sure what. So this is actually the, the critique or the discourse coming from uh, the civil society that these uh, anti-gender uh, ideology actors are actually building on. But the situation between those different uh, groups of uh, organizations is not the same. Um, for example, we see in Slovakia that many of the leading um, NGOs that are contributing to sharing uh, this notion of gender ideology and gender as something that is very dangerous uh, and anti-democratic uh, are actually funded by the EU funds or uh, they are getting money from the national uh, funds, funds that are um, aimed at supporting gender equality. So we see how the feminist organizations and these organizations are sharing the same, very same resources. One example for all, there is a kind of new project, two minutes, great, uh, kind of new um, project that was funded by the uh, EU fund that is aimed at creating a national center for family. And we know that we are talking about a very limited notion of family. Um, it's actually supposed to be a network of uh, services and small organizations across the country. So this is something that has been funded by the EU, uh, managed by the state. Um, so the question is how the EU institutions and state institutions are complicit in sharing the anti-gender ideology discourse. And um, yes, uh, so, so, so that's it. And not only because of uh, supporting this uh, different uh, project, but also because of ignoring voice of uh, feminist and human rights organizations, a voice that has been here for years, but has been overlooked and uh, overheard. So this is something very important because now we are, uh, we are, we are appealing, we, we look at these organizations, at the civil society and ask about their strategies, what they have done and what they are going to do. Uh, I, I think and I feel this is very important to, to take this as a, as a whole picture and to look at it um, in connections. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for bringing in these critical perspectives, and I am sure it is not only relevant for Slovakia. Um, um, so our last speaker in this first round is Elena Zaharenko from Poland, who is a political scientist and policy expert with several years of experience of influencing EU policy in the area of rights through international non-profit organizations. Her areas of interest include sexual and reproductive health and rights, gender equality, women's rights, and social justice. She authored a study on the anti-choice mobilization in Europe, and its influence on EU policymaking, released in 2017. She wrote a chapter on reproductive rights as a social issue uh, in the EU, in the FAS volume, The Future of the European Union, Feminist Perspectives from East Central Europe, edited by Esther Kovács, uh, <laughs> and uh, available online. Uh, and she also co-authored a chapter on women's support to right-wing parties in Poland in the FAS uh, volume, Triumph of the Women, the Female Face of the Populist and Far Right in Europe, edited by my colleague Eliza Gucce. Um, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for, for this event uh, and this discussion. Um, just to highlight, contrary to what the program says, I'm, I'm here very much, as Esther said, uh, in my own research capacity and not representing IPPF. Um, so um, I wanted to talk about the situation um, in Poland, and we've been hearing about, um, you know, the um, the regressions and the, and the backlash in other countries, um, and I think specifically in the case of Poland, this is, a, this is um, an aspect that is very well covered in um, international and European media. Um, and I wanted to broaden the discussion a little bit of, um, of the 
peace government um, policies towards women uh, to also talk about the, the aspects that are not very often um, mentioned in, in this discourse um, and which uh, actually, um, well, the, they nuance the picture very much. So basically, if we're, if we're only looking, especially in the case of Poland, um, at least if we're, if we're only speaking about a backlash um, on women's rights, this, does, this, this only has a limited explanatory power for what is happening in the country. So I wanted to, um, to, to bring up the, the other dimension. So um, apart from um, you know, the policies um, that we've all heard of uh, very much, the attempts to restrict the law on abortion, the, the restriction of access to emergency contraception, you know, um, policies, um, educational policies that um, restrict sexual um, education in schools um, and so on, attacks on, on women's rights organizations. These are very well um, publicized um, occurrences that have been happening over the, the, the course of governance um, of the current government. Um, however, what we don't uh, very often talk about is, um, is the elements um, of socioeconomic policies that the peace government has introduced um, in the country, which uh, actually very much strengthen um, at least some uh, majority of women's access to their socioeconomic rights. Um, and they actually address um, very concrete material needs. Um, so you will also have probably all heard about the, the direct fi uh, financial transfer policy that the government has introduced of um, an extra 500 um, zloty, so 120 euros a month um, to each family with two or more children and, and also um, from the first child um, in the case of um, families in financial difficulty. Um, there's been a strengthening of alimony laws that have actually benefited very much single mothers. Um, mothers of um, four or more children uh, are now um, eligible for automatically receiving a state pension even if they've never worked. Um, there's longer maternity leave for women who have two children in quick succession. Uh, there's free medicine for pregnant women. We have um, a lowering of pension age for women, which has been a very um, welcome policy um, in, in society uh, as a whole. There was a, an overall rise in the minimum wage, which is, again, very um, important, especially for women, because they, they tend to be overrepresented in low-paid jobs. Mm -hmm. Um, we have school benefits for children, and I could go on. <laughs> I will stop here. You get the point. Um, now, these, um, these policies do not meet, um, you know, perhaps our liberal feminist definition of what, uh, you know, gender interest should be. Um, however, um, they do advance many women's very concrete, practical, and, and pragmatic gender needs. Um, they provide the answers and the solutions um, to... Um, to the problems they face as a result of the gendered um, division of labor in society. Um, they provide solutions to, um, to care um, challenges. They provide solutions to uh, you know, supporting um, the material realities of, um, of, of uh, financially disadvantaged families' lives. Um, and of course, this, this also reflects um, the fact that for, for many women in Poland, um, in, in post-transformation Poland, um, the experience of um, the workplace has not been emancipatory. So they haven't found you know, this feminist ideal of, of going out and getting work and being independent as something that's um, actually allowed them to, uh, you know, to realize themselves. For many women, this, is, this has actually been a very negative experience because the quality of jobs that are available to them are very low. They're very low paid. Um, they're precarious. They're in the black market and so on and so on. Um, so what have been the, the political and economic and, and social outcomes um, of, uh, of the introduction of these uh, policies? Um, well, actually, the, the society is very much in favor overall in the, of these policies um, uh, in Poland. So we have 77% social support for the direct financial transfers. Um, there's, um, and there is still, um, when we look at um, predictions for, uh, for voting behavior broken down by gender uh, for, women, for men and women, uh, women are actually slightly more than average likely to vote for, for peace. So the latest poll showed that it was 36% compared to 32% of men. Um, and this, um, you know, I would argue is, is 
clearly down to uh, to the socio-economic policies um, that have been presented to the, by this party and the concrete changes and the improvements they made to the material reality of uh, of, of women's lives. It's the first party in post-1989 uh, Poland that has actually introduced direct financial transfers that has completely redefined the obligations of the state to the citizen. Um, you know, all of the previous governments have always talked about how we have to catch up with the West. Well, this government came and said, you know what? No, let's let's benefit from um, from the wealth that we have. Um, interestingly, uh, we're starting to see this now in the run-up to the uh, European election and the national election later in the year. Um, what, what has shifted in the Polish political landscape is as a result of the introduction of these policies, um, it seems that now all of the parties feel obliged to um, adopt these, um, these very strongly socio-economic um, policies um, for fear of, of, not, um, of not winning the election. So there's actually been a shift in that regard. Thank you. Um, I will continue <laughs> after the questions. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for bringing in these uh, points that um, the Polish government is not just its anti-gender uh, rhetoric and it's not that not only its uh, position on reproductive rights but all uh, these measures and uh, you don't have to be for <laughs> this party to acknowledge that there is something else only going on than the discourse uh, what is maybe not in our uh, favor and also maybe it um, demystifies or uh, maybe it uh, counters this argument that when populists go to power then they fail uh, as gov because they cannot govern uh, or, or they do not govern and um, I think it's uh, I'm saying it also because I come from Hungary um, and so uh, thank you very much for bringing uh, in all these aspects. And I think we got a very uh, broad picture, which also proves uh, to me that there is no such thing as an east-west divide on this. So uh, that uh, um, we in the east sometimes think, oh, we are not developed enough democracies. That's why it can happen. In the west, it's often said, oh, we are too developed. And actually, it's just a backlash against our so many achieved, uh, <laughs> uh, against our so many achievements. And I think this just shows uh, where we are now. So I would maybe before I open the floor, I would just like to ask one more question. You will have two to three minutes to answer, <laughs> and then please think about uh, I, I, I ask the uh, audience to ask about uh, to think about very short questions and, and during that time and so my question to you is now to maybe reflect on what you heard from each other uh, and maybe what you haven't said on similarities you can uh, recognize by yourself I mean we all made the connections I think in our hands but you make make it explicit what you see and or <laughs> uh, um, thinking about the social, political, economic reasons and motives behind these setbacks, what you outlined. So it's not just coming from the sky uh, out of nowhere. Of course, uh, all of you mentioned already um, uh, elements of this, but you know what, uh, what can be the driving forces um, behind this thing. So the order will be the same and three minutes uh, for you each. Thank you. So Leah, the floor is yours. Eh, sì, molte somiglianze, soprattutto eh, anche in Italia in questo momento, proprio ieri è, è stato approvato, il, è iniziato il, la distribuzione di un reddito di cittadinanza ed è una norma contro la povertà eh, che certamente ha fatto questo governo che è un governo misto, eh, ma insomma essenzialmente di destra, ma soprattutto essenzialmente populista e sovranista. Um, quindi è vero che hanno una presa. Eh, io però penso, e, e sono molto simili anche le altre eh, osservazioni, ehm, per esempio questa questione del finanziamento alle politiche antigender e, e non alle politiche di gender. Per esempio, tut, quando io parlavo dell'importanza delle case, perché le case sono la forma organizzativa dell'autonomia delle donne in Italia, quindi una forma di organizzazione diversa da un partito o da una lobby, perché rivendica l'autonomia. Ebbene... Ehm, 
eh, questo, eh, questo tipo di struttura è stata minata appunto partendo dal fatto che non avevamo i finanziamenti per pagare gli affitti onerosi o per pagare tutta l'attività. La nostra casa, per esempio, ha un costo annuo di 6-700 mila euro e noi dobbiamo fare salti mortali per trovarli, quindi è chiaro che avevamo un debito con il Comune per l'affitto. Quindi è vero che una delle questioni è rivendicare un finanziamento alle organizzazioni delle donne che lavorano per le donne. Ehm, Dall'altra eh, voglio dire che eh, questa questione delle donne che accettano, se vogliamo, le politiche anti-gender, dipende anche dal fatto che eh, certamente la, il femminismo ha messo sicuramente in crisi l'ideologia del maschio bianco eh, che ha il potere, che è anche buono quando difende le donne, eccetera, eccetera, ma è anche violento quando le violenta, per l'appunto. E questa crisi del maschio eh, si è riverberato anche sulle, do su alcune, sulle donne, cioè si riverbera come senso di insicurezza per certe situazioni, per le situazioni più fragili. E, e quindi è vero che c'è questo, ma eh, non bisogna dimenticare che molto di, di questa ideolog è ideologia, cioè un'ideologia di un passato e non di un futuro, perché quello che ci troviamo di fronte è un cambiamento epocale, non c'è un passato che ritorna, è una situazione talmente nuova sul campo delle migrazioni, sul campo ecologico, sul campo della crisi del maschile, della denatalità e tutte queste condizioni richiedono pensieri nuovi non pensieri vecchi la destra si presenta con pensieri vecchi metto i confini perché il confine è una difesa ma i confini inizialmente quando sono stati creati sono stati un momento di eh, creatività non soltanto di eh, finisco qua di, di, di difesa e quindi eh, bisogna che eh, si pensi al futuro e alle sfide che questo futuro presenti e non si ripensi al passato eh, penso che, che più o meno questo Thank you very much. <laughs>So, uh, first of all, yes, I, I, I would uh, very much agree that this, um, that this, that, that this anti-gender movement, which is global movement, makes part of a broader anti-globalization uh, or reactive movements to the globalization that has not brought the ideal that has been propagated. And I would very much agree that a chronic lack of social investment is something that can be easily uh, used and instrumentalized to, uh, to, to promote uh, pr uh, p policies that are actually re-strengthening, revitalizing patriarchal order. Because you can have social policies that are, you can support families, and families should be supported, but there are different ways how you can do it. We have the same type of pro-population, pro-demographic pro subsidies, but at the moment what is happening in Croatia is that we had had a series of most brutal, violent incidents against women and children. The last one was that when a guy kicked out, he threw four children out of the window, and two of them are almost, are almost dead. And that is the guy they were living on subsidies for families with more children because it is becoming obvious that people are making money out of having children because there are also towns in Croatia, small towns that are stimulating ch childbirth. You can even get up to 7,000 euro for the fourth child. These are really high subsidies. And they go back to the 90s where Croatia was under, uh, was like uh, having this kind of most extreme nationalist epidemic. Episode where women are always come together, when, you know, the whole kind of proto-fascist ideology always sees women as an object of the nation, that is, the recreating the nation through ch childbirth. So now these questions through domestic violence that is being completely ignored by institutions and underfinanced, now we are 
there is space being open to question the real consequences of such superficial uh, demographic renewal policies. So I think that, yes, social economic policies, looking how they reflect upon uh, gender and human rights policies, this is something that we really need to focus on. And we need to focus on the fact that people feel insecure and they have fear. And because of that, they look for stability. And if you have powerful institutions and very active, uh, proactive civil society organizations uh, focused on creating this Catholic cohesion and unity. Of course, people need safe havens. Um, yes, uh, what I would like to say maybe is that uh, in Slovakia, the uh, one of the actors that are very active in this uh, anti-gender ideology discourse is um, actually our government uh, and the main party um, are social democrats. So we need to be um, very clear that we are not really talking um, only about right-wing right -wing parties and that um, you know, like these actors are very, um, very diverse and whatever, um, I mean, gender can be a tool used for like really um, various parties and actors coming from very different um, ideologies mm. and, uh, and backgrounds. So I think this is something quite specific. Uh, even though, of course, there are many right-wing uh, actors, political parties, and uh, actually some of these uh, right-wing political parties got to the parliament exactly because they used uh, gender ideology as a strategic tool um, to in the, in the election <coughs> campaign. Um, so this was very important uh, a few years ago, and it really helped them, like all this uh, global, uh, global movement or, or global campaigns. Um, what I want to say also, and thank you so much for the for, for very um, very good <laughs> insight into what is going on in Poland, because uh, I would also like to stress that what is very important if we talk about like criticism of uh, like neoliberal policies and. Um, and uh, different measures, we also need to uh, include, uh, and I'm going back to the presentation, that part of this um, neoliberal policies is also a weakening of the civil society. So um, in, in order to look for different ways how to talk about, um, you know, like the allies and the people and whatever, we need to be very careful um, what actually we are really talking about and what, are, what is the situation of uh, different, different people, what are the different ways of um, precariousness, for instance, if we talk about working conditions and, and social and economic conditions as, uh, as well. And then we can maybe see that, you know, it's not very clear uh, what kind of elites we um, usually talk about. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yes, I, I think there's really a clear sort of uh, thread running through through what we've been talking about, and um, I stole a phrase from um, from your slides actually. So there's been a Europeanization with regard to social realities and you know people's uh, people's fears and, and sentiments, and I think that um, this is, this this is at least a factor. Um, that uh, plays a role in, in, in this uh, so-called backlash um, against gender in, um, in, in our uh, countries, in Central and Eastern Europe at least. Um, I think um, there's absolutely um, a role to play by the EU and its institutions that's not really being played in, um, in actually taking a very clear position on, um, on gender equality and women's rights. And, um, it, it hails back to um, the fact that actually EU's policies in this area are very much focused on employment and labor law. This is the origin of, of gender equality in, uh, in the EU treaties. They're, they're meant to um, equalize the working conditions for, for men and women across the different EU member states to prevent unfair competition by cheaper labor um, of women in certain member states uh, and not in others. Um, so um, the gender equality measures introduced by the EU are very much focused on, on labor and market conditions. 
um, they're not uh, so much looking at aspects uh, such as um, reproductive um, rights and, and um, social justice. Um, so this is this is a weakness that is um, created this um, this policy gap um, in the in the European sphere, um, which is now being filled by these anti-gender actors. Very much, I mean, the the examples that you gave in Slovakia of um, of gender mainstreaming funds or uh, gender equality funds being used by these organizations. This is the perfect example. I mean, clearly this is, you know, the, this is some, something is lacking in the definition um, of what these funds are meant to be used for if this is possible, right? Thank you very much. It was, very, again, a very elucidating uh, round, like uh, just to uh, bring up three or four thoughts what I found especially um, um, or particularly uh, inspiring is that all these that progressive parties uh, didn't deliver on promises or, or also the, the globalization uh, affected different people and different classes differently and uh, all these insecurities and fears need to be um, taken seriously because the, also because this can fuel um, the sentiments that uh, turn these people towards uh, these parties or movements and also I, I have to disappoint you it's not only a Slovak uh, situation that it's not only right-wing uh, people who are <laughs> uh, and, uh, against the gender ideology in uh, Budap Budapest uh, Bu no, in Budapest so in my uh, capital one of the major mayor candidates uh, of the opposition is all, all the time against the gender ideology and he's from he's a fervent opposition to our government so um, and also how neoliberal policies uh, interacted with the civil society so it's not just that it started with the right wing uh, uh, what has happened and not to mention all the funding issues so thank you very much for again bringing up new um, uh, issues now is the time <laughs> uh, to the floor. I ask you to ask questions and I ask you to be very precise and short uh, and also say to whom you uh, ask it. So I the first you okay first I take uh, two three questions and then maybe we will have a round. So there the uh, yeah, maybe okay so you you and then you and you okay four people okay and very, very briefly thank yes. you. Hello. Uh, thank you for um, some very, very interesting discussions and presentations. Um, I think this is the first time I'm being translated in so many languages, so that's quite cool also. Um, my question goes um, uh, to um, Ms. Elena. Um, and um, it, it's, it's about a recent report, I think that has come out today or yesterday, uh, which is called the Women in Work Index. And it actually shows that Poland has moved up like quite a bit. I think like two or three places. Um, and I, I think it's very interesting that like while in Poland like you have a lot of these problems when it comes to um, reproductive rights and so on, when it comes to um, women in work, uh, the gender pay gap like is quite low compared to other countries and so on. And, um, I w and my idea is that like maybe it's because of 500 plus like there's upward pressure or something. And I, I would like to know your opinion on that. Okay, let's collect all the questions first. Okay, the lady here, somewhere. Who was he, there? Was here? You were, yeah. Is it full? Um, hello, <laughs> uh, my name is Marina. Uh, we represent uh, with my colleague uh, the Social Democratic Party of Ukraine, and uh, um, I want to ask uh, that question. Um, in Ukraine, uh, on. Um, uh, officially, we don't have uh, um, gender inequality, uh, so everything is perfect, and uh, um, it's set uh, by a constitution, it's set by a law, uh, but uh, um, actually uh, the uh, things aren't so good, uh, and uh, uh, people uh, see that uh, uh, we have uh, some problem. Uh, however, um, most of us, uh, okay, the vast majority of uh, our people tend to think that uh, feminism uh, is uh, um, uh, the war against uh, men, yeah, and uh, um, it's not uh, something positive, right? 
uh, and uh, how can we change uh, their perspective? How, uh, how can we show them uh, that uh, um, feminism uh, uh, is uh, not uh, the war against men, uh, but uh, it's uh, uh, the war uh, for uh, men and women, for that democracy and for that uh, uh, you know, uh, ideal society? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, first of all, of course, thank you all. You're a big inspiration for all of us, and uh, we have a lot to learn from you. Um, I have a small remark, and then my question. Um, the f uh, my remark is about uh, using um, the word populism, because uh, I've heard it a couple of times uh, for the last days, and um, I just want to remark that, uh, can we please shy away and stay away from the liberal liberal uh, uh, discourse that is almost elitist, that this is populist politics? No, it's not populist politics, it's, it's a search of fascism. And what we see in Italy and what we see in Brazil is fascism. And we have to call the things how they are in order to be able to fight them, because at the end it's not going to be the liberals, but it's going to be the socialists who are going to fight the fascists when they come back everywhere. And uh, for me, I very much agree with you on uh, how the um, new liberal discourse has led uh, um, to a lot of the, uh, of the backlash that we see today, because also we can see it in our own family that the socialists and democratic parties across Europe who have embraced the new liberal policies are the same ones that are shattered by uh, the far right because uh, they have turned away from workers and they have turned away from uh, social politics and uh, fighting for uh, socialist values. And my question is uh, very short. It is uh, to Marina. I hope that I, yeah, I, I think I, we, I can uh, relate most of uh, to what you say because I'm from Bulgaria and in Bulgaria, as you know, the socialist party is against uh, the gender right ideology uh, and uh, um, with us the issue is that we do not have uh, the word gender in Bulgarian. It is the same as in Croatia, I saw that you use rot. So we have the same um, phonetic uh, words to, to express uh, what gender means. So my question is now, uh, we lost the battle of the Istanbul Convention as you know. Uh, and. Um, um, now in Bulgaria it has come to to uh, to the point where gender uh, means an LGBTI person. So everybody who is uh, breaking the heteronormative um, narrative is a gender. Um, so uh, my question that I get asked a lot all the time is how do we counter this? How do we re-establish uh, perhaps in a, some kind of a dialogue with this broken Socialist Party of Bulgaria and uh, how do we re-establish uh, what uh, gender is a social uh, what gender is it is a social construct that has to be uh, fought uh, but first it has to be separated from sex so yeah thank you that's my question <laughs> thank you very much The last question here, and then uh, we will sum up uh, here. Hello, uh, my question is for uh, Marina Scrabello. Sorry if I mispronounce it. Uh, this morning, in the Interparliamentary Committee of uh, Women's Power in Politics, uh, the president of Croatia was invited, and she did a really nice speech about gender equality and feminism, etc. So um, I want to know uh, what. Um, does she take like real measure for gender equality or is she more in the side of the Christian fundamentalist? Uh, what is her stand on that? Okay, so I would say that first Elena and Marina are answering the concrete questions and then uh, you can also answer to the more general ones and then Susanna and uh, Leah could uh, conclude. Everybody has one or two minutes. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, on the Women and in Work Index, yes, I, I saw that come up in the news. I haven't had the, uh, the time to look at the actual reports. Um, I, I was also intrigued, I have to say. Um, I, so I'm not sure what the report actually measures, if it's the pay gap or if it's um, sort of income in, in general. Um, I, I don't really want to comment too much because I don't know. What I would say is, um, because you, you linked it to the 500 plus program, and there have been uh, sort of many 
on also very much on the liberal side um, accusations of uh, oh you know this this is a program that's going to make women uh, drop out of the labor market and we're incentivizing women to not be in the workplace but to be at home um, I would just like to point out that if you quit your job because the government gives you an extra 120 euros a month, you really have to ask the question, what kind of job was this? How much was it paying? What quality of work you had? And, um, you know, I wouldn't judge anyone for preferring to take care of their family of course, of course. Um, over working in a job like that. Um, so that's, uh, you know, and, and if, if um, you know, a side um, effect of this program is actually incentivizing women to have better quality jobs and, you know, incentivizing the job market to create workplaces that are um, decent working places um, and that are um, actually, you know, well paid or adequately paid paid, then uh, I would say this is another very positive outcome, and perhaps this is what we're seeing here. Okay, so we can definitely have a little chat about uh, our Slavic phonetic approach to gender <laughs> and how to deal with that in political reality. But uh, yeah, you know what would be my quick fix advice? First, try to reclaim being called, how do they call you? Ro just gender. You're all gendery. Okay. So, I mean, this is what we did. We had a really successful campaign where when a priest and a theologist said that the contemporary problem of uh, women is that they are disobedient to men because they forget that they are secondary because they were made out of Adam. And we made t-shirts saying, I am secondary, I am disobedient, and I am a slut because there was another bishop who said that every woman out of the wedlock who had a child was a slut. So you just reclaim it, you do the reclaiming, and you say, yes, gendery are flying around Bulgaria, and they are going to, you just like turn it around. And the second thing, which I absolutely think is the right way to go, especially in such hostile climate, solidarity. Solidarity works. Solidarity always works. And that means support people, women, men in marginalized positions, uh, and then affirm publicly f what uh, was going on. During the Istanbul Convention, the whole battle in Croatia, our, uh, our foundation, which is a community-based foundation we created with 5,000 euro among us, we ra ran, ran a crowdfunding campaign to uh, collect money to uh, set up a social service of free taxi rides for women who are being treated for cancer. And through that, you can explain what gender is, because it's not the same to live with cancer if you are a woman who has to cook, take care of the family, do all the housework without help, you know, so you d go directly to specific uh, life situations and you practice g gender equality and feminism through solidarity. That's what I believe is the most effective way. Thanks. When it comes to our president, president of Croatia, I also heard that today she had actually, an ins she gave a, an inspiring uh, statement regarding women's power, uh, empowerment, uh, courage, and uh, aspirations. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit ironic, I'll control myself, but the point is that over the last year, she didn't give a single statement on Istanbul Convention. She remained completely silent through massive campaign called Break the Silence, where women came up with hundreds of testimonies of reproductive violence in hospitals, how they were treated, humiliated, and denied access to anesthetics. She keeps silent on all topics that could endanger in any way her uh, rating in opinion polls. Externally, she is all for uh, women's power and equality, very much so in the military because she used to be the public affairs officer of NATO. But when it comes to Croatian domestic use, she is usually silent. Maybe comment also. Um, okay, so that was a question about um, how can we show that feminism um, is not a war against men. Um, well, then maybe I would think about two, two ways how to approach this problem. One is um, 
uh, in in terms of our activities and what we do. And another one is a uh, little bit different. It's about how we talk. Um, and uh, the first one is like keep addressing um, social, economic, and, and other inequalities in society because that's our job, whatever uh, problems people usually have with us. So um, like keep addressing inequalities because that's what we do. Um, and then another one, um, I, I know that this is, uh, there are many myths about uh, feminism and, and, and they will be still there. Uh, what maybe we can do uh, a little bit different is that uh, we shouldn't repeat them. I, I see this uh, very often in Slovakia uh, when, I mean, we have so many discussions about feminism and usually or uh, very often they are structured according to myth uh, about feminisms. So um, very often we ourselves repeat and reinforce uh, this because we want to you know, show that it's not true. So I think we should stick to our agenda, and this is what we need to talk about. Uh, this, this is what we need to articulate. This is what we want to bring uh, to the public discourse. So that would be my. So the concluding remarks for Leah. Uh, Le conclusioni sono un po' complesse. Eh, certo, io sono tra di tra tutti quanti la più anziana, lo dico, eh, non per, eh, lo dico perché sono femminista dal 1970, la prima manifestazione femminista a Roma è stata organizzata a casa mia. Perché dico questo? Perché effettivamente questo discorso contro il femminismo ha una storia lunghissima, ma una storia lunghissima che non ha gambe altrettanto lunghe, cioè si ripropone ogni tanto, ma è destinato a non avere alcun successo. Perché? Perché in realtà, come si diceva un tempo, ehm, noi combattiamo contro la persona che amiamo, noi amiamo gli uomini anche, no? Cioè, eh, e quindi non, non è una battaglia per sconfiggerli, ma è una battaglia per crescere. Eh, per crescere come? Eh, e qui eh, il discorso sulla, eh, sul fatto che bisogna eh, saper sviluppare un discorso, una politica di genere e, e vedere quali sono le nost il nostro modo diverso di vedere il mondo. Noi non vediamo il mondo secondo una linea di violenza. Perché la nostra casa si chiama Casa Internazionale? Perché da subito abbiamo capito che le donne dovevano essere in rete a livello mondiale e non seguire un percorso eh, settoriale o particolare. Perché noi pensiamo che sia una politica di genere? Eh, perché noi pensiamo che il mondo vada curato, eh, che il mondo debba essere... Ehm, affrontato con un'altra ottica, non l'ottica della guerra, ma l'ottica della pace. Questo mi fa dire anche eh, che, ehm, eh, che la parola fascismo, non perché queste persone non siano fasciste o non, siano, eh, o, o non porto in avanti anche delle politiche fasciste, però... Ehm, Uh, queste politiche sono politiche, quello che dicevo prima, uh, che portano il, lo sguardo verso il passato, verso l'indietro, non verso l'avanti. Quando io dicevo che ci sono queste grandi, grandi nuove sfide che il mondo non ha mai visto, nessuno ha mai pensato dieci anni fa, vent'anni fa, cinquant'anni fa che il mondo poteva morire, nessuno ha mai pensato che eh, ci sarebbero state migrazioni di questa potenza, che l'Europa sarebbe stata indebolita da se stessa. Cioè, sono veramente cose così nuove, per cui non ha senso utilizzare anche solo il linguaggio antico, bisogna saper guardare avanti. Questo non vuol dire che noi... Strength and vigor. It so happens that everyone is um, studying the origins of fascism, the Weimar Republic, but what's difficult is to try to see what's happening in a, with, a, with fresh eyes. And I'm not sure that the, um, the, friend, the, 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 left, the left wing, I think, does dip into historical categories um, and does apply labels at a time when it, I think that the analysis has got to, to move on. 
Another I issue is people say globalization has caused many of these problems. Um, but it's also opened up uh, borders. Um, and Europe for a long time had been opening up its borders. And I think we've got to open them not just uh, by taking away the uh, the custom post, but a genuine spirit of uh, of over of overtures um, towards the the rest of the world. And I think that instead of um, closing things off, I'd be much happier if we were opening things up. Thanks. <laughs>
So, um, dear friends, everybody, may I ask you to please uh, take your seat again and um, have a coffee or tea with you, please? I'm, I'm happy to welcome you now to the second panel. Is the mic working? Yeah, it is. Well, for me? No, because we, we don't hear anything. So. Yeah, I don't Just know. Just maybe on that side. Okay, that, no, is the mic working? Can you hear me? Okay. So I'm, I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of the S&D group in the European Parliament, co-organizing this event. Um, we will now uh, have another... <coughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, very good. Okay. Welcome everybody um, to the second panel this afternoon. Um, I'm Stephanie Ricken, uh, political advisor at the S&D Group in the European Parliament, working for the Committee for Gender, Equality and Women's Rights. Very welcome to see you here. Most of you are here for four days now already, the third day uh, for this youth forum. And I think this is an, a perfect opportunity to discuss these very important issues. We heard already a lot about, um, uh, uh, about possible strategies and um, um, solutions, actually, and answers. But I think we can go into depth um, much more in this. So in this second... Um, Around now, we will rather look at, uh, the, um, at the answers and solutions that we uh, may be uh, finding, well, in different areas, in policies, in, in uh, society, also uh, by media. And um, I would uh, like to welcome first our first speaker, which is um, David Paternot. He's uh, um, from the University of uh, Brussels. Uh, David actually is Associated Professor in Sociology and Gender Studies at the University, Université Libre de Bruxelles, where he's also the head of the Atelier Genre et Sexualité. He's the chair of the board of the, Sp of the Specialization Master in Gender Studies, which unites all six French-speaking Belgian universities. His publications include the monograph Revendiquer le gay marriage, uh, Belgique, France, Espagne, numerous articles, chapters, and uh, volumes, including the book Anti-Gender Campaigns in Europe, and also the special issue, The Feminist Project Under Threat in Europe. He's also co-editor co of the series Global Queer Politics, and we would like to hear from you maybe where you see the, uh, the trends and uh, how you analyze this. So thanks a lot for the invitations. Okay. I will try to be brief, and I'll just mention a few remarks, a few uh, points that have sometimes already been mentioned in the, in the first panel, so I think there are a lot of echoes between what I'm going to see and what has been said. And indeed, I will disappoint the organizers. I'm not going to give you solutions. I think also it's not the job of academics to give solutions. This is the job of activists and politicians. And what we should do as uh, act academics is keep asking critical questions and, and keep asking difficult questions or s keep saying it's more complex and it's more difficult. The other thing I think and one of the problems also for researchers is that we work on a moving target. It has been uh, reminded already it is ch changing fast. It is spreading even faster, and I think what is terribly, what is frightening is that what we thought wa was a strong democratic system that could safeguard the democratic liberties is actually collapsing an, uh, at an extremely <coughs> rapid pace, and I think there hasn't been much of a response, so I don't expect much from the EU as I ask, what do you ask from the EU? Well, the EU has shown that it couldn't or didn't want to do anything against Poland of Hungary, so I'm not sure that, I mean, I think it's probably too late, <coughs> and I will... Um, Ironically, but I'm so a bit desperate about what can be done. So it's a big question mark. So having said all these negative things, um, I think the fact of having a moving target is very difficult for researchers because when we, st when we started to work with Esther, uh, among other people, five years ago on that topic, 
We worked a lot about the Catholic Church. That seemed, for instance, to be the big thing, the big elephant in the room at the time. Today, it's just one actor among many actors. And so we need to rethink all the time of theories or approaches or causes because actually what we thought five years ago is no valid anymore or partially valid. And I think that's difficult for us. It's also difficult for practitioners. And it's one of the reasons why it is very difficult to react to those phenomena. And I just want to mention six brief things. And, and the first thing is, I think we shouldn't use old frames to analyze what's happening. It's not business as usual. It's not just anti-feminism as we used to know. It's not conservative Catholic politics. It's not all these sorts of things. And often in the debate, people use the, the tools they have. And I think these tools are problematic because they only allow us to see part of the story. So I think we need to invent new tools, and that's not an easy task. The second thing is there is not one single cause. Uh, so I think we shouldn't be looking for one big principle that explains everything. And you can call that patriarchy. You can call that neoliberalism. You can call that all sorts of things. Actually, it's a combination of different things. Probably the combination is different in different contexts. What's happening in Sweden has probably not entirely the same causes as what you can see in Poland or in Italy. And still there are commonalities. And that makes our work extremely difficult as well. The third question, I think Florian will speak uh, more about this, is uh, we shouldn't call everything populism. Um, empirically, we see we have different actors. It has been said already. We have constellations of actors doing different things. So what we need to understand is how these people who sometimes shouldn't be working together actually manage to work together today. Like Catholics and populists should, normally shouldn't be working together. Still, in some cases, they do. So how is that possible? The, uh, also about populism, I think there is a, a stretching of the concept, the way it is used in, uh, even in the academic circles, but even beyond the academic circles, it is stretched in such a way that it means everything and anything. And it's a, a, a term which is far too vague to be meaningful today. And it's often a, derac a derogatory term. Not to, to, not to, you say, far right, and sometimes it's like a euphemism that has been said already, or it's a term that is used to say, okay, they're the bad ones, and we, the liberals, which, by the way, doesn't mean any space for the socialist, because it's only liberals. Uh, so it's really a binary frame, which I think reduces the scope for the left. Uh, third idea, it's not about religion or not about religion only. It's about sometimes religious organizations, much beyond the Catholic Church, because now we have different sorts of orthodoxies and we have different sorts of evangelicals playing that star in that game as well. And we have also non-religious actors. So it's not, it's about religion when religion is an organized body, but it's not about faith. It's not about atheism against uh, faith, for instance. It's more complex than this. Another idea about what it is not, it's not about left and right. It has been said already by Susanna, among other people. Um, Merkel or Macron are certainly not left, but they do not play in this story. And uh, in Romania or in Ecuador or in other people, this is the left that is pushing the agenda. The first Latin American leader to push gender ideology was Rafael Correa. Extreme left, not even left. So we see it's much more complex again. And the final thing I want to say is we need to be careful with the backlash narrative. In a, and that has been said as well. I mean, the backlash narrative can push us in different ways of thinking. And generally, it's taken for granted. Everyone seems to know what it means. But there is hardly a definition. So if you look, you don't find a definition. And uh, when you try to dig into that, it's often the idea that there is some sort of causality between what we ask for and uh, their reactions. And this is the idea that is the empire striking back on progresses. That idea doesn't work empirically. When you do competitive research, as we have been doing, actually you have, uh, um, you have even backlash before you get actually progressive asking for something. So it really shows that even if we ask for something else, the answer is ready. And I mean, in so many countries, you get same-sex marriage. In Italy, you have a partnership. That works the same. In some countries, there is no reaction against the Istanbul Convention. In, in some countries, you get, as we have heard in Bulgaria, huge uh, reactions. So there is not a clear relation between what is asked and what is uh, given. And I think the problem is, and that will be my final word, it propels us often into some sort of uh, fortress under siege narrative or thinking. And binary thinking, in a sense, we feel attacked. We also feel it's against us. And I think what's happening is obviously partly against uh, some of the progressive agenda, but it's also a much more wider project. And it's not a project against us or against uh, women's rights. It's a, project, it's a project for another understanding of Europe. It's a project for another understanding of democracy in which there is not too much space for women's rights. <coughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, David, for um, pointing out these uh, very complex issues, which even causes, uh, or, yeah, raises even more questions here for us. Um, I'm, I would like to give the floor now to Florian Lang, our next speaker. He's a PhD researcher currently at the VOB, Political Science Department, here in Brussels. And before joining the Evaluation Democratic Governments in Europe research program as a PhD researcher, Florian was a project researcher for the Migration, Diversity and Justice Cluster at the Institute of European Studies. Um, he also worked as a freelance writer for the EU Observer, where he published analytical pieces of far-right populism and democratic backsliding in Europe. And he holds two, two master's degrees, one in European Integration Studies from the Autonomous University of Barcelona, the other one on Human Rights Studies from the University of Vienna. And in his, car in his current um, research, he focuses on mobilization of gender by nationalist, con conservative, and far-right populist parties in Europe and the, uh, repertoire, the, the discursive repertoire used by these parties. So I'm very keen to hear from you what is your analysis and also maybe some solutions coming from the media side as well. So, yeah. Uh, that works. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the uh, invita invitation and uh, the friendly introduction. Um, uh, it's true what David said, like there is going to be a lot of echoing and not just between the panels, but also between the two of us. And I maybe want to quickly already pick up a, a point that uh, David made. Um, so quickly, still to my background, um, I had like guess a reverse angle towards how I approach the issue because I'm uh, for five years working on uh, on right-wing uh, populism, far-right movements and so and uh, rather recently or identified gender as a, as a highly intriguing and highly relevant um, uh, aspect in, in order to understand uh, the rise of right-wing uh, right populism and uh, to quickly already add to it um, if people think that populism is the antagonist to liberalism or progressiveness or anything like that, then you fell in the first trap that populists usually pose to yourself. Because that is not what populism is about. And um, that is one of the aspects that, that is certainly associated to what hinders us to, uh, to understand that uh, uh, better. Um, but I will uh, go to that uh, a bit later still. So um, when speaking about the mobilization of gender by right-wing uh, populists or far-right uh, movements in general, um, I think we can um, also, uh, taking into account the literature, divide between an ideological and an instrumental component in how they uh, mobilize it. Um, the ideological one is, uh, let's say, the classical one, the, what we could call a, a socially conservative nostalgia to a kind of uh, essentialist, uh, naturalistic conception of what, uh, of what gender means or what uh, traditional gender roles means or what uh, uh, family means as, a, as, as the core uh, cell of uh, society and also what follows off of that that, uh, let's say, this anti-gender discourse, that gender studies, uh, feminism, tries to dissolve sort of uh, this sense and um, is kind of seen as an attack on the family. And um, that is one part that is, is probably well known, and I think David and, and also Esther, they're actually uh, better suited to talk about these issues because they're working for that uh, uh, already for a very long time and would rather maybe jump into to the second way. And that is something that, that we actually haven't heard uh, so far and I'm a little bit surprised because uh, we already had the notion of, of right-wing populism here. And that is uh, that right-wing populists um, also invoke gender equality itself as uh, a, delimita a delimitation towards Islam, for example, meaning to say, okay, we as a Western culture have achieved achieved uh, gender equality, and uh, we have an enlightened, superior culture which is, which is under threat uh, uh, by Islam, and um, that kind of rhetoric has has uh, several functions. For for example, the first is that it it creates a threat scenario that uh, women can identify with. For example, sexual violence, like uh, uh, there are buzzwords for that, the rape, uh, rape fugees, for example, or uh, the, the invocation of, of specifically harmful uh, religious practices, like forced marriage, 
and, and those kind of things. And uh, that is something that is very indicative for, for how populism, as I would call it, as a, as a strategy, and I mean, there's a lot of theoretical debate about that in academia, so don't take me too much on, 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 on terminology because I don't want to get into the full debate on that. Um, but I would consider it rather as a strategy or as uh, a kind of uh, rhetorical uh, toolbox. And um, that means that um, uh, like the ideological part, that is, you can see how, I mean, that is also meant with, with the symbolic glue kind of uh, consideration, the kind of allows right-wing populists, although being actually of a far-right component, to kind of enter mainstream conservatism and form broader coalitions ar uh, around those issues like uh, reproductive rights and those kind of things. The other uh, form, this instrumental use, that allows them to also connect to actors in society, to progressive actors, and to kind of uh, point out discrepancies in how society works. For example, in, in that case, when, when invoking um, uh, women's rights vis-a-vis -vis Islam. So you can uh, say, okay, you have this uh, eruption between feminists that are uh, maybe very focused on, on the sexual violence part and they didn't themselves make them uh, sell thoughts about, okay, what does it mean if there is a, a, a large influx of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of Muslim people and you can pin them against uh, anti-racist feminists, for example. So that is, that is a way of how polarization is constructed, or the way of, of, of how uh, sort of the progressive project is, is exposed and uh, kind of weakened in, at the same time. And for that it's important to understand that, that, that populism uh, does not in self, itself entail any, any real ideological underpinning. It doesn't mean something by itself. It, what it does, it, it, it creates groups, it creates an in-group, it creates an external and an in uh, and an internal outgroup and kind of offers people a basket of, 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 of scapegoats. And they put, and, and people always confuse it as, as, as that being a simplistic message and as voters of populist parties or sympathizers uh, would be, have, uh, have a, a simplistic mindset and be anti-everything, uh, but it's not true in that sense. That what really happens is that they offer this, this kind of toolbox of, of scapegoats and the audience of those populist narratives, they create their worldviews around it. They take their own grievances, whether it's real or, or perceived grievances and inequalities, again, whether real or not, and, and build a, a, a worldview around it. And that, in the end, leads to that, that all um, different dimensions of inequalities are put against each other. That, the, and that results then in situations where, for example, somebody has uh, or sympathizes with right-wingers or a right-wing ideology uh, and has a racist mindset will identify feminism as, uh, as an enemy. And not because of what feminism stands for or because of what feminists try to do, but for what, uh, 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 what the feminist identifies itself with or is assumed to be identified. So, and that is being part of this elite, of this basket of, of, of scapegoats. And um, this is very important to realize, especially if one wants uh, to create policies and measures to, uh, uh, policies and messages to counter that. Because uh, uh, society does not work along one line of inequality. It works along very, very different ones. And that is very much overlooked often in, in, in progressive uh, messages, for example, when we speak about very, very uh, specific um, uh, issues. And uh, I think that is a, uh, it's a very uh, important point to realize. I mean, one, one could call that sort of an inter uh, intersectional approach uh, towards, towards inequalities, because it's, it's, it's uh, uh, life realities of people differ extremely much. For example, it's, it's, uh, you're in a completely different situation if you're a woman with four kids uh, in a precarious working situation or if you're a feminist intellectual in, uh, in a big city having an extremely high income. And those kind of things, this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, exposing of discre discrepancies that we have in, in, in progressive messengers is, is a key for, for populists to mobilize against the whole progressive project, let's say. And that is something that I, I, I would say is important to, to keep in mind. And I will stop here and leave the rest for... Thank
Thank you very much, Florian, and also for um, um, raising this idea of uh, the scapegoat aspect. I think we can uh, discuss this further on. After having now seen a few more uh, academic and theoretical uh, aspects and um, see, uh, well, trying to analyze the whole picture, I'm um, hoping we can get some, some concrete ideas now how we can counter uh, <laughs> this um, very unpleasant uh, developments that we all um, see. So I'm welcoming Katriona Graham. She is a policy and campaigns officer with the European Women's Lobby here in Brussels, um, where she works on, on women's sexuality, health, well-being and rights. She is leading the Euro, uh, European Women's Lobby work on um, combating commercial sexual exploitation and also works with the systematic analysis to end patriarchy and promote intersexual values, including promoting migrant women's rights and girls' rights. Um, she has been working at the Migrant Council of Ireland and the uh, Children's Rights Alliance and volunteers with Ruhama and for a, a repeal of the uh, Eighth Amendment. Um, so the floor is yours and ple please feel free to share with us your, your work at the European Women's Lobby but also other ideas that you might have. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so after hearing all these different challenges that we are facing in so many different countries, uh, of course it is going to be very easy now to offer one very simple solution to everything. Uh, but, you know, we will try. Um, so I think what has been mentioned so far today uh, from so many of our sisters and our colleagues uh, across Europe are really reminiscent of the challenges that our members describe uh, who are working in every European country. Uh, the challenge by however you want to call them, far-right, neoconservative, fundamentalist, populists, where they're no longer calling for a breakup of the European Union, challenging the European Union institutions, but instead trying to infiltrate and get inside and mirror our tactics uh, to shape the future of Europe into their image. Like us, they've recognized that the system is not working uh, and for the people that it's meant to, and they see this as a prime opportunity. Uh, they've been very successful in creating an engaging story uh, that is based on fear, hate, division, and scarcity. Uh, they are very clear who they are against. Uh, they are anti-migrant, they are anti-woman, LGBT, anti-minority. Uh, but I think, as was very well described just now, it's, uh, they are never announcing what they are for. There is no singular vision of what the society is that they want to create other than trying to regress to where we were centuries ago. Uh, so what we need to do in challenging this is create a progressive vision that is realistic, is nuanced, it's not overly simplified. We are recognizing that this is a complex, difficult situation that we are facing, but there are solutions and we need to work hard to uh, realize them in our societies. They are on the defensive because we've been making really strong wins. They've had to invest financially. They've had to formalize. They've had to uh, change their strategies because we have done well in past generations and in past decades. So we need to remember that and that a lot of the challenges we are facing are because they've recognized this need to act. So we need to reclaim this vision. We need to reclaim the progress that we have made. And we need to remain singular and not be distracted uh, by this backlash and keep fighting for progress. We need to have a vision that's inspiring so that we can work together at all levels to create a new system. Uh, this vision must be one where leaders are truly representative and inclusive of those they are working for. Uh, it must put care at its centre so that we are no longer working in a society based around economics, but instead putting people and our well-being at the core of what we, changes we are making. We need to tackle poverty, inequality, discrimination as a core part of our purpose. Uh, we need to invest resources and increase our efforts to prevent catastrophic climate change and recognize the interconnectedness of these issues. We need a new form of leadership which is based on empathy, humility, authenticity, compassion. We need to make sure that women are respected, included and can live their lives free from violence and the fear of violence. Consent must be enthusiastic, free from power or coercion and freely given. And we must make sure that people's rights are upheld. We need to create this vision, but really look at what actions need to be taken to realize this. Remember that we have power. We have power together for action. We can see this in many different countries who are actively campaigning together, creating movements, grassroots action. We can see in Ireland the strength of the campaign, which involved all different parts of society in creating a massive referendum uh, result that nobody could have expected how strong it was, and it shows the power when we work together. 
Uh, we look at Poland and how millions of women came together to mobilize against regret regressive strategies and attacks on reproductive rights. The current movement of young people all across Europe who are coming together to fight against climate change and call on those older people who are in power to make action and change happen. And the Me Too movement, which was a, so a huge international dynamic shift. And we can see now the results of that when we start to talk about sexual violence. As we speak up, as we recognize that we do not accept the, the things that are happening to us, we do not accept a normalization of sexual violence in our societies, we have change. We need to act and recognize that women and people of color are seriously underrepresented in political spaces. That seven women are murdered daily across Europe as a result of male violence. The nine million girls across Europe face harassment online before they turn 15. That our media and our publicity does not equally represent women and men's voices. And that we face a pension gap between women and men of 40%. But through action, through leadership, political quotas, ratification of the Istanbul Convention, the adoption of a care guarantee, but, uh, working on gender budgeting, bringing humanitarian focus to our migration policies to end the unnecessary torture and death of asylum seekers and migrants as a result of European policies, and resourcing our social movements adequately, we can show that a feminist Europe is the way forward. We can recognize that while voters currently are people who are coming from traditional power structures and might be swayed by these progressive movements because they can hold and retain their power. If we can bring more people into our movements, bring more people into having political strength, include more voters in our movements, mobilize the public, that's how we can really bring social shift, become a more inclusive movement and keep collaborating together. It takes significant work, but nobody ever said the revolution would be easy. Uh, so we are doing it. Change can come. The time is now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catriona. Um, very um, promising, actually, <laughs> encouraging. And we will discuss this further uh, later on in the debate. And I would like to give the floor now to uh, Esther Kovac. Um, Esther Kovac holds a Bachelor in soci Sociology and a Master in French and German Studies and in Political Science. Since 2016, she is a PhD student in the Political Science at Alta University Budapest, uh, working at the uh, right-wing mobilization against political correctness and gender ideology in a global context in connection with the developments within progressive movements. She has been working with the Hungarian Office of the Political German, German Political Foundation Friedrich Ebert Stiftung since 2009. And since then, uh, 2012, she is responsible for the Foundation's gender program for East and Central Europe. And there she has been editing several volumes, all available online. Um, in 2015, she co-edited the volume Gender as Symbolic Glue, the Position and Role of Conservative and Far-Right Parties in the Anti-Gender Mobilization in Europe. And in 2016, uh, the volume Solidarity and Struggle, Feminist Perspectives on Neoliberalism in Central Eastern Europe. So the floor is, yeah, <laughs> you might mention this later on. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. How much time do I have? You have seven, seven minutes. Seven minutes. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Um, okay, I have six or seven points. It depends. Um, so I would start with giving a gender definition of what I use, and then I will tell why I'm saying that. Uh, I, what, I, what I think gender is, or how I use it, is that the socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities, and attributes that a given society considers appropriate for women and men. This is the gender definition of the Istanbul Convention, and I think it is important to uh, clarify because this is not the only gender definition progressive actors use. So it's not only the right wing that thinks that uh, if you are LGBTI, then you are uh, a <laughs> gender. Um, um, I teach uh, um, feminist social theory uh, at the university, and at the first class I ask the students, what do you think gender is? And among the first answers they say, uh, well, the gender you identify with. And this is a completely different definition. It's an identity-based individual definition than the one uh, which is an analytical one to describe roles, but doesn't question that a woman is an adult female. So um, I'm just saying this because it makes our work also more complicated, uh, and there are also uh, contradictions uh, uh, among us on the progressive side. Um, it is also very difficult, I would like to uh, connect to David who also said it's a moving target and it's very difficult to analyze because it is happening right now and when I say right now, <laughs> it is right now, this morning in the uh, Hungarian propaganda press, uh, what is a... Um, 
uh, how to say, the, um, basically this is the way how the government communicates with us. Uh, yes, it's uh, not uh, journalism. Uh, so uh, an article appeared, an editorial, uh, basically without an author, that we demand that uh, Fidesz party uh, uh, quits the European People's Party. Um, and then this is uh, and said that the European People's Party is uh, not uh, conservative anymore, but it is as liberal as the liberals and uh, destroys national European and gender identities. Uh, so it is uh, basically part of our everyday language and everyday political uh, struggles. Um, but in the Hungarian context, when they attack gender studies, when they attack uh, uh, Istanbul Convention, it is uh, always linked to uh, trans and uh, gender queer uh, definitions of gender and uh, activist claims. I know it is not uh, overgeneralizable to every country, but in the Hungarian case, this is. Uh, uh, what uh, they use mainly. But if we analyze the attacks against gender in the Hungarian context, is um, we, we tend to overemphasize the importance that, oh, they are attacking a critical concept of gender, but it is embedded in a much bigger struggle. The, as you know, the Hungarian government is reconstructing uh, and redefining uh, the terms uh, um, of liberal democracy or how they want to see it. So Orban already announced a huge... Uh, uh, policy uh, against culture and against science, and this is one element of that. So we should see it all in the uh, bigger uh, framework. Uh, I would say it for Hungary, and I think in uh, many cases it is just it is one element, and it's uh, very difficult to separate from others. With Veronika Grzebalska, I authored a paper which is online available with the title "Beyond Anti-Women Backlash." Uh, and basically we are trying to disentangle these concepts, uh, what we have already discussed in the first panel, and uh, David was also mentioning that we should be very careful with these labels, also with the old concepts, uh, but also with uh, labelings, uh, labels like misogynist, we are overused that, and anti-feminist. Uh, and it is, firstly, it is analytically not very uh, uh, precise, but it is also sometimes that we tend to mix up electorates with the um, anti-gender actors so, or the parties. So in Hungary, 49% of my, my country people voted for the ruling party, 24% voted for the far right at the last elections. I have very big difficulties to call 70% of my population as misogynist. Uh, they are not. So it, there is, um, uh, and, and of course they get angry if the liberals uh, just go around with labels uh, like that. And we are um, recreating also a lot of taboos with this. If, uh, for instance, in um, what uh, Elena was just saying in the last panel, she uh, listed all the things what uh, the government uh, uh, was doing in favor of women in pragmatic sense. I, I could do that for Hungary too. Uh, I, I, I get regularly uh, that, oh, it means you want to vote for Fidesz. It means you are for the party. So basically, um, um, there is this uh, liberal consensus that, that wants itself to be kept uh, and creates those taboos. So just because we are attacked, it doesn't mean that uh, we are beyond criticism uh, uh, and that uh, we should um, not address uh, things. So I think um, um, we should look at this, uh, at this uh, demand side. I mean, it is, of course, it's not a short-term strategy or you cannot <laughs> make a, a policy out of it immediately, but that really for, in, in, in the Hungarian case, we always say, okay, now we have time. So it, <laughs> we will not change it in the near future. So now we, maybe we can afford thinking. Uh, and uh, what is the demand side for this? So is, are these, these conservative attitude, attitudes, reminders from middle ages, uh, there, um, or so what? What feeds uh, this and? Um uh, uh, parts of them were already mentioned by the others, like uh, the way how we uh, or the progressive por forces imagine gender equality maybe don't always fit the realities of the people. So uh, we conducted a research on women's situation in Hungary last year, and uh, it's for the overwhelming majority uh, work work at the labor market has nothing to do with emancipation. The working conditions uh, and the pay is so uh, demeaning. Uh, it, you know, we, we really need to understand those people who want to escape the labor market or who, for whom it's not, not doesn't mean anything. Um, uh, 
And, but also, I think what we need to uh, look at also inequalities uh, uh, in Europe. So when we, uh, we take labor market participation as an indicator of uh, uh, gender equality, uh, then, the, for instance, in Germany or in Austria, the labor market participation of women is much higher uh, than in Hungary. But on which price? That they manage to outsource care work to Eastern European women. Uh, it's not against Germany, it's a, there is a huge great crisis in Germany, but, uh, or in Great Britain, or in Austria, but uh, the, the, the wide um, masses of Ukrainian, Czechs, and uh, Hungarians uh, go to these uh, countries. So uh, then the, uh, ah, there is a rainbow. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. Maybe I should stop at this point, uh, but I cannot. <laughs> um, so I think we need to uh, look at this and also um, not to think about this as Hungary is lagging behind and uh, Germany or Great Britain is the great for forward. Okay, one two minute. more minutes. Okay, cool. Um, um, one more point maybe I would like to uh, address. Uh, I mean, it's a very difficult one and it's just very briefly, uh, is that uh, there are certain tendencies within the progressive activism uh, that could also be uh, criticized. There, I would just call one thing. Uh, what I would call individuals, individualized intersectionality. Uh, this is my own concept. Uh, <laughs> and basically the idea that um, but when we want to address multiple forms of oppression, like patriarchy or uh, uh, racism, that um, in certain activisms, um, the uh, people are equated with their positionalities. That me as a cis, white, middle class, able-bodied woman, what can I say, what can I not say? Uh, and um, there is an overview, overuse uh, of this and uh, labelings of uh, um, uh, people which is not helpful for uh, um, dialogue, so we also might look at critically on uh, ourselves or on this. So in, when in, uh, everybody asks uh, who, why do people vote for uh, uh, Fidesz, for instance, then we should also ask uh, who should they vote for. <laughs> uh, so the, we, there is a huge problem with alternatives and a huge uh, problem with representation, how the opposition parties and where the Hungarian society is. So uh, uh, again, this is a um, uh, point uh, to discuss uh, among uh, ourselves if we want to understand why these parties are so strong. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Esther, for this uh, very self-critical view, of course, and um, provocative uh, thesis, so maybe this can be discussed later on. Um, I would just like, uh, I know that it is very difficult, but I would still like to come back with a very concrete question um, to you, Ma, the, the speakers of the panel, but also to the audience, because I know there are very um, intelligent people here in the room and uh, demanding people as well. Um, if we look at the concrete uh, solutions or um, strategies that you can think of, um, what do you think, or can you play, please uh, share with us your ideas about what your expectations uh, are actually concerning um, um, politics, politicians? We are here in the European Parliament. We will have elections very soon. Uh, well, we are organizing this on behalf of the S&D group, of course, among others. So uh, the different roles uh, that we could take, uh, for instance, on behalf of the policy, uh, political field, but also academic, civil society, um, I would, be, uh, would ask you just to look at this maybe for the next, for, for two minutes, the speakers, but also ask you from, from the audience, of course, you're welcome to come up with your comments, your questions and pro suggestions. Which what do you expect from the European Parliament? From the Parliament, from poli the question. The question was, what would you expect concretely from politics mm -hmm. and also from civil society, also from media, maybe? Media plays a very important role here, as we heard. It's all interlinked. And um, what can we do in these areas? So, as I said, I don't have a magic solution, otherwise I wouldn't be here and I would make a lot of money, <laughs> because that would be very uh, much asked. I mean, two, two ideas, I think. Uh, one thing is, uh, and, and the second one connects to, to this parliament concretely, one thing is I think we need to go back into the grassroots and we need to go back into the communities. Populists can win because we haven't been there. 
and we haven't explained what we should be doing and we should sometimes get out of our comfort zone and, and go back into the arena. That's one thing. The second thing, and that some people might call that populism, uh, Florian might come back to that uh, maybe. The, the second thing uh, that is important, I think, and, and that's for academics, is share what we know, is what I'm doing a lot uh, at this moment, uh, instead of working on other things and publishing as I should be doing. And the, the second thing is also watching, monitoring people. Example of monitoring, uh, it has been, uh, people have talked about the World Congress of Families, where well, you may know that this, the president of this parliament was announced after the, the main, uh, one of the main keynote speakers to this event. And apparently it's because of me, because I shared information with someone, activists started to contact the MEPs, and it's how MEPs contacted the, the president of this parliament saying, well, you, that's not okay, you shouldn't be there. I know he has disappeared from the program, so I will be there with other people, we'll see whether he's still there or whether he's actually disappeared. Thank you very much, and uh, it's true that we had a very good cooperation on, on that. <laughs> Actually, I hope we have been um, successful until the end. Um, would you like to... Yeah, um, in general, like uh, what you mentioned with the media, and, and I'm working a lot on social media, and I'm, I, I can safely say that I spend more time on, uh, on the, in the abyss that is uh, social media that any sane person should do, and... Uh, it is definitely true that social media, and uh, I, we heard it in the very beginning when uh, thinking of something like uh, Me Too, that it is not necessarily possible without something like that, the type of uh, um, uh, mobilization and, and, and awareness raising. Uh, briefly to Me Too, I would like to add that Me Too started a long time before and it became popular when rich white people uh, got interested into it. So that is, that is already a, uh, like a link to, to what I want to say about social media because what, what is important are two things. The first thing is that uh, social media are an industry. It's an attention industry. It's not uh, something that the government or the world government get, uh, gave benevolently to us as a discursive space. So, uh, and that means that uh, also Activism, as much as uh, as much from the right or the left or progressive or liberal, works in that uh, attention cycle. So uh, it, it is not a medium where people inform each other and debate something out, but it's uh, it's 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 a medium where where we mark our own identities and where we rage against other people. So what what is really lost, and I I, I know it's a it's a big criticism against uh, like the fourth uh, uh, wave feminism, so so to speak. Um, to get, get like uh, co uh, this constant loop of, of of rage and moving on to the next rage without actually never really saying what do we want and uh, what needs to be done, and uh, I, I think social media in general is just not a very uh, suitable medium for that. So uh, we should not put too much our hopes in that because uh, in 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 playing that medium, uh, uh, let's say the enemy is much more savvy and much more um, it fits much much more to their style and what they what they uh, try to do and um, when it comes to the political I mean that you mentioned that kind of thing you know like that's uh, uh, we sit here in the parliament we think what can the parliament do what can the EU do but the very same people they're sitting in here they're working this floors so what are we actually talking about so we can we can of course I mean the parliament does uh, many great things and and we we have this discussion rounds we have uh, the FEM committee that does uh, a great work but then in the end who <laughs> who controls the EU, it's nation states, and there were, were uh, 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 nationalists and autocrats have a say in what uh, is happening. So I don't see how that can be bridged because all those kind of things, the stories that we tell, those things that, we, that is something that exists for years and years and years and nothing has really come out of it. So why would it change now? And most certainly you can pin it into every kind of political direction. I mean, uh, to say like, okay, it's, it's, it's like the neoliberal system and kind of the neoliberal consensus that, that, that avoids that. But um, in the end, uh, uh, it, it really requires a fracture with something and not uh, this uh, camp making between, uh, okay, we have the Europe pro-European uh, camp or we have the progressive camp and the not progressive camp because it's just reinforcing those kind of polarizations and it leads in the end to nothing if there is not a, 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 a real majority or a real uh, policy way to, to really uh, uh, fight for that. Thank you very much, Florian. So, Katrina, please. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, so I think before coming into some concrete examples of steps that can be taken, uh, I'd mention a few principles that I think we need to reflect on. Uh, I completely agree that we need to go back to grassroots campaigning, working in local communities and drawing the connections between people who are at the front lines, uh, working in streets, working in local communities with national level governments and international level working. We need to make sure that the progressive solutions that we're coming up with at a European level are one that will actually have an impact for people on the ground that will be felt and realized. A good example of that is even while it sounds like it should be the most boring thing ever, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulations, that's something that everyone across Europe, I think, has had to come into, uh, into contact with. So something like this, it shows the impact that Europe can have on people's lives, but we need to get more ambitious when it comes to social justice issues and not just about regulation of data. Uh, so we can go farther and use those kind of examples to see the kind of change that we can make. Uh, we need to talk about how we communicate around political issues. So we have these really complicated situations, but we need to be able to make them uh, something that we can grasp. So again, as we start to make this shift uh, in politics, that it's about real solutions, not politicians saying, I will give you the sun, moon, earth, and stars, because we know that feeds the idea that you can have unrealistic aspirations. Instead, how can we shift back towards this is what we can actually do that will actually work and actually make change. And then paired with that, to make sure that we can still win people over in voting, we need to have a different type of education when it comes to politics. We need, we need to have an education system that promotes critical thinking and analysis, and not just data rote learning, and one that really engages people so that they can really work with political systems, know how they work, and analyze more closely what politicians are saying, so that as you get these populist messages, you can really see, actually, what do they mean? And I know immediately, I don't have to have somebody support me through a process of analyzing it, but I can see the problems there. And finally, accountability. I think we need to look at the institutions and the systems. End impunity for people who try to undermine those systems and how democratic processes should work, and really make sure that we're communicating that we recognize there are issues with our European institutions, we recognize there are issues with our political systems, and actually make progress, be brave about that, and say we will change them and work on that uh, openly. Uh, when you talk about solutions, so we have our manifesto campaign uh, for the European elections. Uh, a nice little chance to plug it. Um, so this is, it's called 5050 Women for Europe, Europe for Women. And we set out a number of different policy recommendations uh, under our key theme areas of work uh, that are both aimed at the European institutions and at member states. Uh, it has things like quotas, uh, that we need to really come back to having a, an institutional strategy for equality between women and men, which we ran out of a few years ago and a new one hasn't been brought in. Uh, we need codes of conduct that set out the kind of activities that are expected and the kind of uh, principles that we expect our leaders to adhere to. We can see that trust in institutions is grossly undermined when you hear examples like the level of sexual violence being perpetrated by UN staff members and the... Uh, the me, you, the me Too in the EU institutions. So these kind of problems really undermine the trust as we're trying to strengthen it and promote it. So again, coming out with real solutions to that. Uh, the ratification and implementation of the Istanbul Convention to combat violence against women and bringing in real legislative directives around combating violence, uh, realizing the directive on trafficking, combating trafficking in human beings, having a directive around uh, combating sexual exploitation. So going past having resolutions and motions of support, but really actually driving change and implementing uh, action. Reforming on our migration policies, looking at the kind of conditions that people are being expected to live in, uh, in these temporary asylum centres, and really moving for complete reform of how we approach migration. Uh, gender mainstreaming in the multi-annual financial framework, which is the framework that all of the European budgets work under, making sure that women are resourced, that we actually name explicitly women and girls in ring-fenced funding, because when we know it's included as a general principle, it's not prioritized, and we don't see funds going where they need to go. Um, and then finally, looking at how we can work with private institutions. So we talk about the media. How can we set up guidelines for best practice? Uh, when we're looking at the massive tech companies, how can we work with them on regulation towards uh, trying to find a feminist uh, European internet space and ending the kind of um, innocence that they can come back to where they say we don't hold third parties to account for the kind of content they host on their sites, but actually really driving for change there too. Thank you very much. Very good <laughs> in <coughs> inputs. So you can discuss. 
So there are, there are clearly ideas and strategies. <laughs> Um, yes, I would like first to mention the role of the media on that sense that uh, uh, this fight for the clicks <laughs> uh, distorts um, many things and they are, that, that is the reason why they are so sensationalist and tabloidist and also very uh, eager to set up debates with pro contra positions and uh, um, it's I think very much limiting our space, I mean I have no influence on that, it's just that uh, it makes, uh, it is one of the conditions um, among which we try to differentiate the debate and um, uh, so uh, what I think is the most important for us and I would say for politics uh, uh, and for um, NGOs or civil society alike, alike is this overcoming this false <coughs> dichotomies of populists versus liberals and search wherever we can more differentiation and also that not to label those who don't agree with us. We, I think we tend to um, uh, very often spare us debates that if somebody is not agreeing with us we say oh this is not democratic or it is not on the right side of history or is against human rights. Uh, if somebody tells you uh, that he, he is against uh, same-sex marriage, is it uh, a, a right away a homophobic or not? Or can we, wh how, 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 do you, how we do we try to uh, uh, convince that person? Or, is, or can we ask the question, is uh, same-sex marriage the the only way forward, or is it an, uh, an indicator of uh, e equality between uh, gays and uh, heterosexuals? I mean, can we make up uh, uh, these debates or not? Uh, so I think um, <laughs> we, we need to reinvent political fight and conviction. And if we want to, if, okay, let's go back to the grassroots, but not only to explain them what we want, but also to <laughs> uh, listen to them. Uh, um, uh, and uh, because also all these... Um, how to say, um, this progressive times when, or the, when the progressives had uh, more power, uh, uh, we were a bit spoiled that, yeah, it's, in, I mean, I speak for NGO, uh, in, from NGO perspective, that it's easy, to, it's, it's, the task is to lobby the, uh, the political power uh, with expertise and uh, uh, materials and um, the dependence was on funds and on donors. Uh, but uh, it was the peop the, uh, these people were not uh, accountable towards constituencies and the societies. Uh, and now, uh, in the Hungarian case, when the, all the money is <laughs> almost away, I mean, we really need to reinvent how to uh, reconnect to uh, society when uh, there is no such uh, direct way to uh, policy and that uh, this uh, technocratic solution that or technocratic idea that there is a gender expertise uh, and there are the experts who know that uh, uh, normal people cannot. Uh, it should be left to the uh, um, experts. It also depoliticized the issue and that uh, so we, we need uh, ways to uh, reinvent uh, and um, we have a very big <laughs> difficulty in our context that we have a more and more autocratic and repressive regime uh, and it limits the space of discussion because we feel this danger coming and then it, we always repeat each other. Yeah, but let's not have these internal discussions now we have the bigger danger um, and we have to fight together and I think we shouldn't um, limit us uh, and um, and have uh, um, have those debates for instance about the whether market actors are helpful for us or not how they are uh, um, um, sitting on progressive causes and making their own uh, um, um, gains uh, out of it without uh, furthering uh, really the cause or how we uh, imagined liberal progress and that it's, it's not a, a linear way and maybe we should rethink our um, concepts how, how we want uh, things forward. And maybe we can think about unusual alliances, maybe it's not unusual but connect to uh, organizations, actors who are not feminist uh, or who are not pro-gay in the first place, but uh, um, who fight for uh, issues like, uh, in, in the Hungarian case, I could say the nurses movement, the, uh, the trade unions, uh, who fight now against the slave law, which uh, will, uh, I mean, the, this um, law on the uh, supplementary hours that were uh, extended um, um, recently, so uh, that we <laughs> try to look out of our uh, progressive organizations bubble. Uh, um, I mean, it depends, of course, on the context. Uh, trade unions could be also in our uh, um, bubble, but uh, that, uh, to try to work with those. In, Hungi in Hungary, the, the most successful women's movement in the last years was the uh, movement of the mothers of disabled children.
So maybe we should learn from them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther, on, on all of you for your very um, uh, useful uh, pr proposals and suggestions. And um, before I, I'm going to, to open the floor to, to the audience, I would like um, to benefit from the occasion, because we are talking about alliances and the joining forces, I would like to mention uh, um, an initiative that was taken here by the, uh, by, by the progressive forces within the European Parliament. Uh, it's the so-called All of Us campaign, All of Us, All of Us platform, that was um, found actually in 2014 already by uh, the Socialists and Democrats, together with um, ALDE, the Liberals in the European Parliament, Green and the European left and um, we actually um, this was actually a reaction to the growing uh, restrictive anti-choice initiatives that of, of ultra uh, ultra um, conservatives and religious um, forces and organizations here um, uh, that was uh, getting more and more um, visible also in the European politics. And so we are organizing since then on a regular basis um, activities, conferences here in the European Parliament. And I think this is also um, on, on issues, for instance, like um, um, uh, sexual education, um, but also conscientious objection, rainbow families, access to contraception and, and safe and legal abortion. And I think this is a very um, good example how uh, how we can yeah join forces and really um, collaborate and um, have alliances uh, throughout the the progressive parties here and, and political groups here in the European Parliament because I think this is um, what we need to do as well really to join forces and become more visible and and um, vocal when it comes to counter these these uh, these developments because they are very visible and very well organized as well and um, so just to give you this idea but now I would like to um, give the floor to you of course and the see hands raising here so I would like to ask you to be precise short and also maybe that you mention um, whom you're addressing to your uh, whom you want to address your question um, okay, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to see socialists and democrats to create some kind of ideological academies. This is something that we work, um, we want to do in Greece, but we didn't do it. Um, and I believe that it would help a lot for the young socialists uh, to know their roots and the, purpose of, the purposes of social democracy, because nowadays uh, we see that uh, a lot of people don't know uh, the history and uh, and the ideas that uh, social democracy uh, represents. Uh, the second one I want to say is that I would like to see a more uh, radical program, uh, a program uh, closer to the old-fashioned one, uh, like the GOTA program and all that. And the third one I want to say is that I believe that what David Easton used to say, that uh, knowledge produces... Uh, produces actions that there's no there are no values uh, th there are always values in uh, in uh, academics so I believe that we should fund uh, LGBTQI studies in every country because for example in my country there are no there's there are no studies like that and it's very important also Michel Foucault used to say that uh, knowledge produces uh, power and the opposite and the last one I want to say is that I believe that S and D should uh, Ha, should, should put supervisors. Uh, I've made and, uh, a formal proposal with uh, via email. Uh, should have uh, should have supervisors in uh, every country to monitor what the politicians there that belong to the family are doing. Because a lot of times we see, especially in south or eastern countries, that politicians come here, say different things, and then they come back and do a whole other things. And this is this kind. This, you, you feel like they are making fun of you uh, when you're in your country. Okay, so I would like to see a change in that. This is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for these comments, and uh, probably you want to, or maybe you want to react, be, be, but I suggest that we just <coughs> collect some questions. <coughs> Please. <coughs> Uh, I'm Andy Vermoot from the organization Post Versa. Um, I have a first question for Esther. Um, if we think if we want to overcome regression in women rights, I think it starts uh, with education, uh, a topic like uh, world citizenship, mutual understanding and equal rights, uh, also citizens education uh, with also a form of historic critique uh, into the topic. Uh, what do you think about uh, this idea, Esther? And then I have a question to uh, David. 
um, women are the biggest uh, victims of uh, the European austerity policies. And what is the uh, socialist answer on, on, on that question? Uh, for uh, uh, Fl Florian, that's your name, yes. I also have a question. Um, I see a lot of people from the eastern countries, uh, also from Russia, also from Ukraine, also from uh, uh, Poland, uh, are used here in, uh, in, in, in Europe, in other countries, in Belgium also, as uh, low cost, for low-cost jobs. Um, uh, a lot of these people work in the black market. Uh, they don't have uh, any rights. For example, in Spain, we have a lot of uh, migrants also working in the or orange industry, uh, they keep the people there, the migrants there, they are good, they can be used as low-cost jobs, uh, and so also a lot of women are, are victim of, of, uh, because they are living in, in camps, so uh, what could be the answer of Europe to, to stop this? Uh, and uh, I still have a, a, another question to Irene. Um, uh, Irene, that's your name, eh? okay, um, because we are in a luxe position here. We have a fantastic position here in Europe to talk about uh, equal rights for women, but I think we also have uh, make to, to change the world and make links with the uh, African feminist uh, movements, eh? because um, are we doing that? Are we making these links to have these equal rights in the uh, African continent, but also a lot of people from, for, I know people who are from Taliban living here also in Europe, and they um, import uh, actually a bit this, what they've seen in their education here in, in our system. So uh, what would be your answer, and is there now a link? Uh, are you working also to have a sort of progressive movement for equal rights in, in the African countries? Thank you. Hi, I'd like to thank the whole panel. Um, this is addre addressed to Catriona, picking kind of a question about an alternative. Um, I think there is a growing trend of neoliberalism, which is pretending to be feminism, and this celebrates multinational companies, personal ga gain, and individualistic empowerment. I went to a feminist conference in London, and someone said quite rightly, you always hear about self-care, but never about community care. So... I was wondering, how do we attract people back to a collective action, like a collective movement for women's rights and liberation? Hi, my name is Ruby Green. I am a economics and critical identity studies student from Bullitt College in the United States. So my perspective is a very US oriented one. But my question is, how do you think that um, we should deal with the fact that mainstream feminism is predominantly white feminism and fails to include women of color and often makes them choose between their gender and their race? And how will feminism shift its focus from equality to equity and implement policies that focus on intersectionality? Hi, thank you for uh, your speeches. Um, so my question is going to be for Esther. Um, and it's also in relation to the individualization and fragmentation within feminist uh, movements. Um, so my question is rather regarding, like, what do you think, what is the relation between uh, the individualization and internal fragmentation of uh, social movements and between, uh, and between what, we, what we talk about now as a backlash against, uh, against uh, feminism and, uh, and women's rights uh, issues, and also maybe in relation to how academia uh, kind of thinks of uh, uh, feminism and like, the increasing like, intersectional focus that is, of course, very important, but risks like, um, further fragmenting collective interests. Thank you. I suggest we close for the first round now and um, give you the, the uh, occasion to answer. I don't know if you want to. I would like to start later. Okay. I think that, that was one question to Irene directly. 
How lucky. Uh, I can start with the um, answers. Of course, we are definitely working with uh, social justice, with gender equality in Africa. That's very, very close to the heart of IPPF, which is actually a global organization. So we have local members in every African countries, and women's rights is really at the heart of what we do. So we are having these uh, linkages, and of course, actually, we are fighting for sexual and reproductive autonomy for the empowerment of people all over the world. We did it, and we are doing it in Pakistan, we are doing it in Afghanistan, and of course we are doing it in Europe. And it doesn't matter where the oppressive or liberticid uh, forces are coming, if they are coming from certain religions or other religions or other worldview, we will always fight them. So that's no doubt that for IPPF this is a major cause and that we apply a human rights uh, approach. Thank you, Irene. Um, there was a question. I think you, you mentioned uh, Esther, but I, I guess it was Catriona, right? Yeah. I want to take that. Uh, sure. So um, in terms of the forms of education, uh, I think that we need to look at holistic reform of the education system in terms of overall, when I talk about rote learning, I think we see too many of the systems, no matter the subject, that are more around just rote learning and learning to listen to what the person is telling you instead of to think about it, to challenge it, to engage with it. Mm -hmm. So I think overall it's about the whole system of education. Also seeing in each country that there are programs specifically around, as you say, citizenship, politics, engagement, what it is to be a member of society, uh, to be part of your local community, to be part of your national community, to be part of the international community. Um, and I think as well, of course, that this links into what we talk about in terms of comprehensive sexuality education. And you look at the principles we need to see there that go beyond just the biological and also talking about the kinds of relationships we have, but being able to start that from a very young age and base it in conversations that link to consent, but are around how do we want to treat each other? How do we respect each other? How do we really put at the center of those conversations the well-being of other people around us? So again, it links back really strongly to this idea of individual individualism versus systemic analysis. Uh, so I think that leads into this question around within feminist communities, how we see this shifting and, and these two different groups that are having either a very systemic analysis or more of a kind of neoliberal individualistic focus uh, that is quite often fed, uh, fe feeding into and fed by the capitalist system. And I think in terms of attracting people back to more of an analysis of what's going on affecting wider communities and how do we make really a holistic reform it's looking at this intersectional approach. It's recognizing that intersectionality isn't about an individual person and you know who is tokenistically at the front, but how do our policies reflect the needs of all people? How do we bring more people throughout the process of a movement, of a project, of a campaign, of an organization? Uh, if we talk about inclusion of women of color, if you are speaking and you are only a, an all-white organization, how can you purport yourselves to be able to really adequately represent and reflect the needs of women of colour, but you can't invite a woman of colour into a space that isn't going to be welcoming, into a racist space. So we need to challenge ourselves within our own spaces to do better to think more critically about what messages we're sending. And then I think if we can really do that, we will show that this systemic analysis is the one that has the impact for most people. Thank you, Kadriona. So is there yeah, anyone okay, <coughs> I will um, try to answer uh, your question. Yes, sorry. Um, I would like to connect it also to the former remark of the how uh, neoliberal feminism <laughs> raised or how uh, empowerment and choice and freedom, so all these very important concepts were reinterpreted and now um, serve other uh, other goals. Uh, we see all this market of femvertising fem that feminism sells and we know how, how these companies uh, make women work in Bangladesh. Uh, um, among which circumstances, so not very uh, credible, but uh, uh, and I think this uh, also contributed to uh, so how these uh, concepts have changed. We also, if, if we speak about choice, what is we shouldn't give up the concept, but at least we, we should be aware that it, it should it has uh, been misused uh, and that uh, very often we. Um, and I think this uh, part of the problem is that uh, we 
we stopped uh, criticizing the economic system. We stopped criticizing the, uh, the exploitations. It seems like uh, we want that uh, the one percent rules the world or has, I don't know, 70 percent of the world uh, wealth, but just 50 percent of them should be women. Uh, I mean, this is not a, a feminist goal for me. We should, uh, and, if, and this is my understanding of intersectionality, that we should uh, understand patriarchy and capitalism and how they intersect with each other and not policing people that uh, if he or she or they can speak uh, um, because of this and that uh, position. So I think there is a shift uh, from structural problems to individualized uh, um, strategies uh, or proposing of strategy or, or language. Uh, um, and the, um, this is maybe because we think that the scale is, we, we just cannot change the system. That uh, many people escape in Hungary the, the state, uh, um, I don't know, the, uh, the healthcare system, they, they go to private, they, uh, they escape the education system if they have the means, instead of, change, instead of making huge movements uh, uh, for the bettering of the education or healthcare system. So I think it, uh, it is uh, together in, a, in a, um, and I think it is related to this neoliberal cooptation and uh, that is how in, I think the concept of intersectionality has also changed and this, uh, in uh, our context it's regularly uh, the gender ideology or this uh, scapegoat gender ideology is always accused of yeah yeah you, I know what you want to say you say that I cannot speak because I, I'm a cis heterosexual man uh, so I think we should um, tidy up on this field <laughs> too yeah thank you Thank you. There, there are, I think, <clears throat> two more reactions from your side, but if we can have uh, it short, and then we maybe can answer a few more questions from the audience. So just briefly, I'm not going to answer about the uh, austerity politics because I'm, I'm not uh, the organizer, so I will let them do that if they want to. But I, what I wanted to say, I think, I mean, I think the challenge, and it's both politically, for instance, with the All of Us campaign, or it's also the same among social movements, is how we can unite, because I think on the one hand, uh, I mean, for instance, progressive actors, or, or the, I don't like that term, but the democratic actors unite together, because I think this is what is at stake, is how we defend democracy, but at the same time agree that we disagree on certain things. So that would be my answer. The, the, the only point why I would disagree with, with, with what Esther said, uh, I had a conversation a few days ago with British colleagues who were discussing whether gender is that or that or whether it should be with the anti-trans feminism and the pro-trans feminism. I think it's just losing energy because why we do that and obviously opponents choose that topic on purpose the same way they have chosen surrogacy in France. They have chosen topics that would be divisive so that we fight each other instead of fighting them. And I think this is really how we should find what should be sometimes pragmatic, recognize we don't agree always, but still we have to work together because this is the only thing we can do. Uh, just very quickly to the, to the question posed about uh, um, uh, immigration from Eastern European countries and how many, uh, especially women, are then caught up in uh, a precarious job. Um, in general, it has a lot to, to do with the imperfection of the, of the European single market because it's not a real single market because there is not a real freedom of movement. So people of all types of qualifications do not freely move around those countries. And because there is a certain logic in this, okay, that uh, usually uh, people in, in one economic space move from the economic periphery to the center where there are more jobs, that is a very contentious issue in politics in, in general. So like uh, in Germany, uh, in Brexit, we saw it with the, the Polish plumber, so to speak, and, and uh, in, in Germany, you have the, the same type of discussions. And an answer to that in the end, it's, it's, it's car it, it takes a lot, a lot of courage for any uh, political party to make the working conditions of those people uh, as a subject because it's so uh, uh, contentious. So in the end, courage is the only solution. And of course, on the European level, um, to try everything, but I'm uh, not an economist and I'm certainly not an <laughs> economic politician, to find an answer to how can the, uh, the single market work better because that is, that is the root cause of why we have uh, that uh, type of situations. Thank you. I, I think the uh, interpreters will uh, have to leave at half past five. <laughs> is that true or do you have, are you, no, longer? Okay. <laughs> No, we always also have to think of the um, yeah of their working time, of course. No, that's good to know. So we can maybe I'll open up for another round of questions for the last minutes before we go to the interpretation. Just to give you the floor as well, because you.
the three of you here. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Oh, I think it's working. Okay. Uh, my question would be addressed to David and Esther mainly, but I would hope you others will also react something. Um, you know, you uh, you touched the uh, the problem of uh, capitalism and patriarchy uh, heading into the bright future hand in hand, and how. Uh, capitalism and patriarchy are embedded into each other. And I would like to ask you that, um, you know, David was talking about that uh, the situation is really detailed and uh, really complex, uh, and there's, there isn't a single solution for our problem. But um, isn't capitalism is the sole problem we face right now? I mean, it is an, econ it is an economical and uh, indirectly a social system which constantly re creates the inequalities. And... Um, what do you think about uh, tackling gender equality through tackling uh, capitalism itself? And um, also, uh, Esther is mentioning in her articles pretty often, but uh, like, uh, if in, in, among this uh, group, the Socialists and Democrats in the European Parliament, uh, we, want, we don't want to go beyond uh, capitalism. But uh, if we take, for example, the Scandinavian welfare state, um, those countries avoid exploitation among their societies, meanwhile they exploit the South, for example, or, or the East. So you can't avoid uh, exploitation if you're staying in the framework of capitalism. So I would like to have your opinions on this, if, if you would uh, like to give yours. Thank you. This is a very complex question, of course, but I, maybe I can invite you, those who really have a comment maybe to make and not a concrete question. There was one lady here, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I, my name is Sarah King. I work in the Workers' Group Secretariat at the European Economic and Social Committee. Um, thanks very much for a very, very interesting um, panel, very thought-provoking. Agreed with a lot of what you said. Not everything, but a lot of it. Um, just a couple of things, um, that aspects that for me were missing, but actually uh, one of the, lady, the lady over there actually raised one of them. Um, but the first one was the issue about power um, and the dynamics to do with power in relation to gender, and you know, race and other forms of inequalities um, and discrimination and how in the context of the backlash I think that's one of the sort of key aspects um, as to you know, what is happening. It's about you know, power structures sort of fighting back to sort of preserve um, you know, a status quo. Um, so that was just one, one reflection. Um, the other thing uh, which I said um, the, the lady over there mentioned was um, in the context of the discussion about collectivism which I think is extremely important and the link with direct action the role of trade unions. Um, and, you know, I know that there are a lot of criticisms that can be brought um, to the trade union movement for things that they have or haven't done. Um, but I think when we're looking at, you know, what institutions do we have um, to try to, um, how can I put it, to redress the balance of power um, and to sort of move forward in terms of collective action, solidarity, I think we can't overlook um, the role that trade unions have to play. And just finally, a point of information um, in relation to the work of the European Economic and Social Committee. Um, in the context of the role of civil society, I think, in, 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 in Europe or the European Union, the ESC has a specific role as being the voice um, of European civil society. And I would say to people, um, you know, if you don't already know about the committee, which probably you don't, um, have a look at the website, see who your national members are and contact these people to ask them what they are doing on these sorts of issues. Um, one of the things we are actually doing at the moment is we have um, an own initiative opinion, which basically means it's come as an initiative from one of our members, um, one of our female members, um, and it's an opinion on gender equality issues. Um, and, very, and one of the issues that's raised in that opinion actually is the issue of the backlash and you know, what we're seeing. Um, and also, um, one of the things that we want to push for in there as well is the need to have um, you know, a European strategy on gender equality issues. So thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I think we have to really um, come to an end here. I can, I can take one more. Somebody who maybe wants to have a, um, a concrete um, com a comment on, on what has been said. Okay, please. Um, okay, so I have a question relating to something that Ms. Kovac said, but um, it's a question for anyone really. Um, I'd like to ask you to shortly elaborate on how we could Okay, so you implore us to rethink um, the or to deconstruct maybe the basic uh, values of 
um, feminism of every such movement, but how, how that should be done without further creating division um, on, on, uh, on an already weakened um, uh, field. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your very good ideas and thoughts. I, I would ask the, um, the panelists now to just um, shortly react maybe, um, and um, then we come to our conclusions. <laughs> Okay, just briefly, capitalism and patriarchy. I would say, I mean, there's some people who are saying anti-gender is the new strategy of neoliberalism or capitalism, what you, you come Historically, each time that uh, di different inequalities have been subordinating to class and to uh, capitalism, they've never been solved. And that's in the case of feminism, they get forgotten always. So I, I would rather think <laughs> complex systems of inequalities that are interlocked and interact with each other instead of explaining everything by one system of uh, inequalities. Then the other thing about, I mean, briefly, EU institutions and what it could be done, I would love the EU institutions to do something, although given the commission we might have in a few months, I'm a bit skeptical because if we give too much power to the European Commission, it might be a nightmare in, in a few months. But then the other thing is really, um, you, I know some people have been trying to do things, uh, uh, vocally or not, and they couldn't, and they were blocked. And, and so my question is really just, the example to close with, I was one of the academics coordinating the uh, opposition to the, to, to the ban on gender studies in Hungary. Uh, emailed on behalf of everyone, uh, leading officials in the commission, I got a very nice letter first saying, we're watching carefully what's happening. So when it happened, I sent another email saying, what are you doing now? Well, I'm just waiting for the answer. Okay, I don't have a short answer, but maybe we can continue later. But uh, uh, thank you very much for this. I think um, I don't think that uh, what you raised or what I raised was that we want to explain everything by capitalism. It's just that the, um, um, they should be looked at together. And I, I really believe that without raising what all this exploitation around uh, produced by the current forms of capitalisms, or I don't know how to call this what we are having. Uh, I mean, without that, we will not solve gender equality. We can uh, tell men to ma do more care work as much as we want, as long as the uh, the employer uh, can tell the father that, hey, you don't want to lose the uh, only uh, secure job in the family, do you? Uh, so um, in our uh, research, I um, told about earlier this um, um, how women in, hung in Hungary feel uh, the labor market is really a very huge, it's not about work-life balance, it's a huge tension that it's contradictory, the, the way how the ideal employee is imagined and how the competitiv competitivity forces the company. So it's not about evil companies, what I am saying. It's that the, this is the systemic logic. This is, contradicts how we live lives and how we want to care for each other and we need time for that. And uh, it's not about, okay, let's, only improve uh, institutions so that we can put all our old people and children there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, uh, I mean, uh, so I think, um, and also the West-East thing, that, uh, that's also one of my problems with the work progressive, that we, we sometimes think that there is, there is a, a progress is possible at the same time for everyone. Uh, although I think that uh, progress is always, uh, because of this logic, uh, on the shoulders of others. So when we uh, say that, oh, how good they were the 50s and the 60s, uh, uh, the social democracy in Western Europe, uh, to which price was that welfare, welfare, price, uh, um, welfare state uh, uh, to which country? So I have to stop here now, but uh, we can discuss it later. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Esther, for your <laughs> short answer to a complex uh, question. Um, so I think to, to try and wrap up, I think the questions around individualism, I think uh, individualism can become very attractive because over the years, as we started to make some gains, we started to gain a little bit of power. Uh, and with that became an attraction uh, and the possibility of some complacency. So I think we need to really hold ourselves to account and make sure that uh, to us progress doesn't become a few privileged people being able to fit into a we, I'll use patriarchy for shorthand into a patriarchal system, into a traditional system of power inequality, uh, but instead that we really work to dismantle that. So we end that complacency and we drive forward. Uh, we don't get distracted by these regressive voices, by these fundamentalist voices. Instead, we hold true to a vision uh, and that that vision is based on hope. Yes. 
Yeah, I, I want to quickly uh, react to uh, the point that you made uh, when it comes to discussion uh, discussion and fractions uh, within a movement and also with what David said, like with the, with the type of discussions that we want to have and this disagree to dis uh, agree to disagree kind of uh, thing. I think it is very, very important that also not only on the inside but also on the uh, outside democratic forces, so to speak, show what democracy means. And that does not mean that we find a set of things and everybody adheres to, and if you say something different, then you're out and you're a populist, but to show what, 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 what healthy debate in that sense look like. And I would really disagree to say like, that, that, uh, that those kind of fractions weaken uh, like the democratic movement. I think it's rather the other way around, when it's done the right way. And of course, it's, uh, there are various instances where, where you see people doing it the wrong way, but I think in general it's very, very important. That's also what I meant a little bit with this, uh, for example, stylizing like that election now into, okay, they're the pure Europeans and they're the populists and the right-wingers. Like that is very, you know, like this is very easily to exploit it, you know, because like the message itself that one pro-European thing could do uh, is yeah, is already incorporated in the other narrative as a lie. So we can show by discussing things, by breaking up uh, clarities, that we have a lively debate. Thank you, Florian. And then the floor is uh, to Irene um, Donadio. She is uh, the senior lead of, for partnership and strategy at the IPPF. Okay, I will try to go through the whole uh, journey with it. And uh, when I when I was given the task of doing the conclusion, so great, I don't have to do any presentation. But then I realized that in fact it's a big challenge, because the discussion was super rich, and I think it was very interesting. We went through discussing how feminism can be disruptive, how illiberal regimes are trying to uh, undermine people's autonomy, and in particular, women's rights. How we need to demystify what they are doing, and particularly identifying the type of different attacks that they do, and also understand the big complexity. I think that the first speakers, but also David and Florian and Esther, spent a lot of time telling us what the traps are, what the wrong terminology would be, what the nuances are, and, and also in the first panel, we saw that it's very hard to go binary. It's not only ultra-conservative, they are populist. It's not only ultra-conservative, they are anti-gender. We have anti-gender also within the socialist and the democratic movement, between very, very, uh, very left-wing uh, countries in, in, in many parts of the world. So we have to be very conscious about not oversimplifying and the same we had big discussion around partnership versus uh, liberalism versus capitalism versus austerity versus exploitation in the labor market and how the European Union was constructed how the values have been built that said after spending so much time saying what the problems were and the challenges with the funding shrinking space predatory attacks on reproductive rights sexual rights women, uh, violence on women. We finally went to some more constructive <laughs> discussion focusing on solution. Uh, and then we had a lot of uh, suggestions, particularly from uh, Catriona Massey, who came out with a whole panoply of different things that we can do, refocusing the narratives, refocusing the public discussions around care, around the local communities, engaging with the local communities. That was something that was also said by David and by many others, that we have to go back to the grassroots. I couldn't agree more, and that's also something we are doing very much at IPPF, speaking to the communities, but also think beyond any academic wonderful analysis, remember people have to understand when we talk. So there is a lot of a big blah blah discussions that we do around a lot of very complex interesting sexy topics that people don't understand don't have a clue about so there is a huge issue around messaging looking at narratives that people really understand because one thing we know is that the people who are working on the right-wing populist side are very strong on communication they're strong on social media they're strong on communication they're strong on hitting certain fears and of course, they build their narratives in a very smart way. They do research, they know what they're talking about, and they build something that people want to hear. I also appreciate it very much how much uh, Elena and Esther pointed out that we have to be empathic 
and rational in this discussion in the sense that you cannot label entire countries or a vast majority of public opinion in any given country as stupid, fascist, misogynist, idiots, because that doesn't really take us very much forward. I would say that is valid also for my country. I'm sorry that Leah has gone. We certainly see predatory attacks that we have never seen before. And we have to be careful. Yes, it's partially fascism, but it's also something very new. On the other hand, we cannot go out and label everyone as a populist idiot, because that doesn't really work. And I think it was very interesting also how Marina addressed one of the questions around how you can domestify also the issue on placing feminists as the hate of the man or the attack against man. And that is translating into something real, something people can relate to, something people can understand. For example, she was talking about explaining gender through explaining the situation of women who have cancer and have to go to the hospital. That goes beyond the academic issue around is gender more gender identity or gender roles or LGBTI issues. Of course, the, we had a lot of weak spots. And our Bulgarian friend pointed out the fact that we use a word that in a lot of languages doesn't exist, and that can be so easily twisted into an insult or in a reducive vision of what gender is being only transgender or LGBT and how they can depict certain groups as the monsters. And they do for a reason. They do first research, they know what people are afraid about, and then they start dividing. And I really appreciated also what David said. We have to be aware of our differences, of our strategies, but we have to keep united because they are very smart in dividing the different fronts, the feminists, the white feminists from the black feminists, the feminists from the LGBTI movement or the trans women or the migrant women, you know, they're playing with all of these identities issues, the nationalistic issues, the Islamophobic migrant issues. We have to be smarter and certainly we have to be empathic and put aside the differences, go grassroots, share knowledge, and fight together. And that, for me, was maybe the most vibrant, more important conclusions of all these different discussions. And a lot of new concepts, like uh, Marina coming with a human security prize. You know, certain new way of framing stuff that people haven't think to make it concrete, women dying because of uh, the lack of support in, uh, in the protection of women um, against violence. So there was a very rich discussion, and I'm sure you're very tired now. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much um, well, to all the panelists, to the audience for this very fruitful debate, and I think there have been lots of uh, ideas coming up. I thank you very much also for the very good cooperation with FAPS, uh, Friedrich Ebert Foundation and uh, Jean Jaurès Foundation, and I wish you all a very nice evening. Hope to see you soon.